Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads. Section 1 of The History of Emily Montague, Volume 3, by Francis Moore Brooke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cast List Emily Montague, read by J. M. Smallhair. John Temple, read by Alan Mapstone. Arabella Ferma, read by Matteo Bracis. William Furmore, read by Kevin S. Lucy Temple, read by Lynette Calkins. Colonel Edward Rivers, read by Jim Locke. Captain J. Fitzgerald, read by Larry Wilson. Narrated by Lynette letters one twenty five through one thirty two letter one twenty five to colonel rivers at montreal quebec april seventeenth how different my rivers is your last letter from all your emily has ever yet received from you what have i done to deserve such suspicions how unjust are your sex and all their connections with ours do i not know love and does this reproach come from the man on whom my heart dotes the man whom to make happy i would with transport cease to live can you one moment doubt your emily's tenderness have not her eyes her air her look her indiscretion a thousand times told you in spite of herself the dear secret of her heart long before she was conscious of the tenderness of yours did i think only of myself i could live with you in a desert all places all situations are equally charming to me with you without you the whole world affords nothing which could give a moment's pleasure to your emily let me but see those eyes in which the tenderest love is painted let me but hear that enchanting voice i am insensible to all else i know nothing of what passes around me all that has no relation to you passes away like a morning dream the impression of which is effaced in a moment my tenderness for you fills my whole soul and leaves no room for any other idea rank fortune my native country my friends all are nothing in the balance with my rivers for your own sake i once more entreat you to return to england i will follow you i will swear never to marry another i will see you I will allow you to continue the tender inclination which unites us. Fortune may there be more favorable to our wishes than we now hope, may join us without destroying the peace of the best of parents. But if you persist, if you will sacrifice every consideration to your tenderness, my rivers, I will have no will but yours. Letter 126 to Miss Furmore at Sillery, London, February the 17th. My dear Belle, Lucy, being deprived of the pleasure of writing to you as she intended by Lady Anne Melville's dining with her, desires me to make her apologies allow me to say something for myself and to share my joy with one who will i am sure so very sincerely sympathize with me in it i could not have believed my dear bell it had been so very easy a thing to be constant i declare but don't mention this lest i should be laughed at i have never felt the least inclination for any other woman since i married your lovely friend i now see a circle of beauties with the same indifference as a bed of snowdrops no charms affect me but hers the whole creation to me contains no other woman i find her every day every hour more lovely 
there is in my lucy a mixture of modesty delicacy vivacity innocence and blushing sensibility which add a thousand unspeakable graces to the most beautiful person the hand of nature ever formed there is no describing her enchanting smile the smile of unaffected artless tenderness how shall i paint to you the sweet involuntary glow of pleasure the kindling fire of her eyes when i approach or those thousand little dear attentions of which love alone knows the value i never my dear girl knew happiness till now my tenderness is absolutely a species of idolatry you cannot think what a slave this lovely girl has made me as proof of this the little tyrant insists on my omitting a thousand civil things i had to say to you and attending her and lady anne immediately to the opera she bids me however to tell you she loves you passing the love of woman at least of handsome women who are not generally celebrated for their candour and good will to each other adieu my dearest bell yours j temple letter one hundred and twenty seven to john temple esq pall mall Celeri, april the eighteenth indeed is that haughty gallant gay lothario that dear perfidious absolutely my dear temple the sex ought never to forgive lucy for daring to monopolize so very charming a fellow i had some thoughts of a little bandinage with you myself if i should return soon to england but i now give up the very idea one thing i will however venture to say that love lucy as much as you please you will never love her half so well as she deserves which let me tell you is a great deal for one woman especially as you will observe one handsome woman to say of another i am however not quite clear your idea is just catism if i may be allowed the expression seeming more likely to be the vice of those who are conscious of wanting themselves the dear power of pleasing handsome women ought to be what i profess myself who am however only pretty too vain to be envious and yet we see i am afraid too often some little sparks of this mean passion between rival beauties impartially speaking i believe the best-natured women and the most free from envy are those who without being very handsome have that je ne sais quoi those nameless graces which please even without beauty and who therefore finding more attention paid to them by men than their looking-glass tells them they have a right to expect are for that reason in constant good humour with themselves and of course with everybody else whereas beauties claiming universal empire are at war with all who dispute their rights that is with half the sex i am very good-natured myself but it is perhaps because though a pretty woman i am more agreeable than handsome and have an infinity of the je ne sais quoi apropos my dear temple i am so pleased with what montesquieu says on this subject that i find it is not in my nature to resist translating and inserting it you cannot then say i have sent you a letter in which there is nothing worth reading i beg you will read this to the misses for which you cannot fail of their thanks and for this reason there are perhaps a dozen women in the world who do not think themselves handsome but i will venture to say not one who does not think herself agreeable and that she has this nameless charm this so much talked of i don't know what which is so much better than beauty 
But to my Montesquieu, there is sometimes, both in persons and things, an invisible charm, a natural grace, which we cannot define and which we are therefore obliged to call the je ne sais quoi. It seems to me that this is an effect principally founded on surprise. We are touched that a person pleases us more than she seemed at first to have a right to do, and we are agreeably surprised that she should have known how to conquer those defects which our eyes shewed us, but which our hearts no longer believe. It is for this reason that women who are not handsome have often graces or agreeablenesses, and that beautiful ones very seldom have for a beautiful person does generally the very contrary of what we expected she appears to us by degrees less amiable and after having surprised us pleasingly she surprises us in a contrary manner but the agreeable impression is old the disagreeable one new it is also seldom that beauties inspire violent passions which are almost always reserved for those who have graces that is to say agreeablenesses which we did not expect and which we had no reason to expect magnificent habits have seldom grace which the dresses of shepherdesses often have we admire the majesty of the draperies of paul veronese but we are touched with the simplicity of raphael and the exactness of correggio Paul Veronese promises much and pays all he promises. Raphael and Correggio promise little and pay much, which pleases us more. These graces, these agreeablenesses, are found oftener in the mind than in the countenance. The charms of a beautiful countenance are seldom hidden. They appear at first view, but the mind does not shew itself except by degrees when it pleases and as much as it pleases it can conceal itself in order to appear and give that species of surprise to which those graces of which i speak owe their existence this grace this agreeableness is less in the countenance than in the manner the manner changes every instant and can therefore every moment give us the pleasure of surprise in one word a woman can be handsome but in one way but she may be agreeable in a hundred thousand i like this doctrine of montesquieu's extremely because it gives every woman her chance and because it ranks me above a thousand handsomer women in the dear power of inspiring passion cruel creature why did you give me the idea of flowers i now envy you your foggy climate the earth with you is at this moment covered with a thousand lovely children of the spring. With us, it is a universal plain of snow. Our bow are terribly at a loss for similes. You have lilies of the valley for comparisons. We nothing but what with the idea of whiteness gives that of coldness too. This is all the quarrel I have with Canada. The summer is delicious the winter pleasant with all its severities but alas the smiling spring is not here we pass from winter to summer in an instant and lose the sprightly season of the love a letter from the god of my idolatry i must answer it instantly adieu yours etc a firmer letter one hundred and twenty eight to captain fitzgerald yes i give permission you may come this afternoon there is something amusing enough in your dear nonsense and as my father would be at quebec i shall want amusement it will also furnish a little chat for the misses at quebec a tete-a-tete -tete with a tall irishman is a subject which cannot escape their sagacity adieu yours a f letter one hundred and twenty nine to Mrs. Temple, Palmel, Sillery, April the 20th. After my immense letter to your love, my dear, you must not expect me to say much to your fair ladyship. I am glad to find you manage Temple so admirably. The wisest, the wildest, the gravest, and the gayest are equally our slaves. 
when we have proper ideas of petticoat politics. I intend to compose a code of laws for the government of husbands and get it translated into all the modern languages, which I apprehend will be of infinite benefit to the world. Do you know I am a greater fool than I imagined? You may remember I was always extremely fond of sweet water. I let them off lately upon an idea, though a mistaken one, that Fitzgerald did not like them. I yesterday heard him say the contrary, and, without thinking of it, went mechanically to my dressing room and put lavender water on my handkerchief. This is, I am afraid, rather a strong symptom of my being absurd. However, I find it pleasant to be so, and therefore give way to it. It is divinely warm today, though the snow is still on the ground. It is melting fast, however, which makes it impossible for me to get to Quebec. I shall be confined for at least a week, and Emily not with me. I die for amusement. Fitzgerald ventures still at the hazard of his own neck and his horse's legs, for the latter of which animals I have so much compassion that I have ordered both to stay at home a few days, which days I shall devote to study and contemplation, and little pert chit-chats with papa, who is ten times more fretful at being kept within doors than I am. I intend to win a little fortune of him at piquet, before the world breaks in upon our solitude. Adieu! I am idle, but always, your faithful, a firmer. Letter 130. To the Earl of Blank. Sillery, April 20th. Tis indeed, my lord, an advantage for which we cannot be too thankful to the supreme being, to be born in a country whose religion and laws are such as would have been the objects of our wishes, had we been born in any other. Our religion, I would be understood to mean Christianity in general, carries internal conviction by the excellency of its moral precepts and its tendency to make mankind happy and the peculiar mode of it established in england breathes beyond all others the mild spirit of the gospel and that charity which embraces all mankind as brothers it is equally free from enthusiasm and superstition its outward form is decent and respectful without affected ostentation and what shows its excellence above all others is that every other church allows it to be the best except itself and it is an established rule that he has an undoubted right to the first rank of merit to whom every man allows the second as to our government it would be impertinent to praise it all mankind allow it to be the masterpiece of human wisdom it has the advantage of every other form with as little of their inconveniences as the imperfection attendant on all human inventions will admit it has the monarchic quickness of execution and stability the aristocratic diffusion strength and wisdom of counsel the democratic freedom and equal distribution of property when i mention equal distribution of property i would not be understood to mean such an equality as never existed nor can exist but in idea but that general, that comparative equality, which leaves to every man the absolute and safe possession of the fruits of his labors, which softens offensive distinctions and curbs pride by leaving every order of men in some degree dependent on the other, in the midst of those gentle and almost imperceptible gradations which the poet so well calls the courting music of a well-mixed state. The prince is here a center of union, an advantage, the want of which makes a democracy, which is so beautiful in theory, the very worst of all possible governments except absolute monarchy in practice. I am called upon, my lord, to go to the citadel to see the going away of the ice, an object so new to me that I cannot resist the curiosity I have to see it, though my going thither is attended with infinite difficulty. Bell insists on accompanying me. I am afraid for her, but she will not be refused. At our return I will have the honor of writing again to your lordship by the gentleman who carries this to New York. I have the honor to be my lord, your lordships, etc. William Fermore. Letter 131. To the Earl of Blank. 
Sillery, April 20th, evening. We are returned, my lord, from having seen an object as beautiful and magnificent in itself, as pleasing from the idea it gives of renewing once more our intercourse with Europe. Before I saw the breaking up of the vast body of ice, which forms what is here called the bridge from Quebec to Point Levy, I imagined there could be nothing in it worth attention, that the ice would pass away or dissolve gradually day after day, as the influence of the sun and warmth of the air and earth increased, and that we should see the river open without having observed it by what degrees it became so. But I found the great river, as the savages with much propriety call it, maintain its dignity in this instance as in all others, and assert its superiority over those petty streams which we honor with the names of rivers in England. Sublimity is the characteristic of this western world. The loftiness of the mountains, grandeur of the lakes and rivers, the majesty of the rock shaded with a picturesque variety of beautiful trees and shrubs, and crowned with the noblest of the offspring of the forest, which forms the banks of the latter, are as much beyond the power of fancy as that of description. A landscape painter might here expand his imagination, and find ideas which he will seek in vain in our comparatively little world. The object of which I am speaking has all the American magnificence, the ice before the town, or to speak in the Canadian style, the bridge, being of a thickness not less than five feet, a league in length, and more than a mile broad, resists for a long time the rapid tide that attempts to force it from the banks. We are prepared by many previous circumstances to expect something extraordinary in this event. If I may so call it, every increase of heat in the weather for near a month before the ice leaves the banks every warm day gives you terror for those you see venturing to pass it in carrioles yet one frosty night makes it again so strong that even the ladies and the timid amongst them still venture themselves over in parties of pleasure though greatly alarmed at their return if a few hours of uncommon warmth intervenes but during the last fortnight the alarm grows indeed a very serious one the eye can distinguish even at a considerable distance that the ice is softened and detached from the banks, and you dread every step being death to those who still have the temerity to pass it, which they will continue always to do till one or more pay their rashness with their lives. From the time the ice is no longer a bridge on which you see crowds driving with such vivacity on business or pleasure, every one is looking eagerly for its breaking away to remove the bar to the continually wished and expected event of the arrival of ships from that world from whence we have seemed so long in a manner excluded the hour has come i have been with a crowd of both sexes and all ranks hailing the propitious moment our situation on the top of cape diamond gave us a prospect some leagues above and below the town above cape diamond the river was open it was so below point levy the rapidity of the current having forced a passage from the water under the transparent bridge which for more than a league continued firm we stood waiting with all the eagerness of expectation the tide came rushing with an amazing impetuosity the bridge seemed to shake yet resisted the force of the waters the tide recoiled it made a pause it stood still it returned with redoubled fury the immense mass of ice gave way a vast plain appeared in motion it advanced with solemn and majestic pace the points of land on the banks of the river for a few moments stopped its progress but the immense weight of so prodigious a body carried along by a rapid current bore down all opposition with a force irresistible there is no describing how beautiful the opening river appears every moment gaining on the sight till in a time less than can possibly be imagined the ice passing point levy is hid in one moment by the projecting land and all is once more a clear plain before you giving at once the pleasing but unconnected ideas of that direct intercourse with europe from which we have been so many months excluded and of the earth's again opening her fertile bosom to feast our eyes and imagination with her various verdant and flowery productions i am afraid i have conveyed a very inadequate idea of the scene which has just passed before me it, however, struck me so strongly that it was impossible for me not to attempt it. 
if my painting has the least resemblance to the original your lordship will agree with me that the very vicissitudes of season here partake of the sublimity which so strongly characterizes the country the changes of season in england being slow and gradual are but faintly felt but being here sudden instant violent afford to the mind with a lively pleasure arising from mere change the very high additional one of its being accompanied with grandeur i have the honour to be my lord your lordships etc william fermore letter one hundred and thirty two to mrs temple pall mall april the twenty second certainly my dear you are so far right a nun may be in any respect a less unhappy being than some women who continue in the world her situation is i allow paradise to that of a married woman of sensibility and honour who dislikes her husband the cruelty therefore of some parents here who sacrifice their children to avarice enforcing or seducing them into convents would appear more striking if we did not see too many in england guilty of the same inhumanity though in a different manner by marrying them against their inclination your letter reminds me of what a french married lady here said to me on this very subject i was exclaiming violently against convents and particularly urging what i thought unanswerable the extreme hardship of one circumstance that however unhappy the state was found on trial there was no retreat that it was for life madame de turned quick and is not marriage for life true madam and what is worse without a year of probation i confess the force of your argument i have never dared since to mention convents before madame de between you and i lucy it is a little unreasonable that people come together entirely upon sordid principles and then wonder they are not happy in delicate minds love is seldom the consequence of marriage it is not absolutely certain that a marriage of which love is the foundation will be happy but it is infallible i believe that no other can be so to souls capable of tenderness half the world you will please to observe have no souls at least none but of the vegetable and animal kinds to this species of beings love and sentiment are entirely unnecessary they were made to travel through life in a state of mind neither quite awake nor asleep and it is perfectly equal to them in what company they take the journey you and i my dear are something awakened therefore it is necessary we should love where we marry and for this reason our souls being of the active kind can never be totally at rest therefore if we were not to love our husbands we should be in dreadful danger of loving someone else for my part whatever tall maiden aunts and cousins may say of the indecency of a young woman's distinguishing one man from another and of love coming after marriage i think marrying in that expectation on sober prudent principles a man one dislikes the most deliberate and shameful degree of vice of which the human mind is capable i cannot help observing here that the great aim of modern education seems to be to eradicate the best impulses of the human heart love friendship compassion benevolence to destroy the social and increase the selfish principle parents wisely attempt to root out those affections which should only be directed to proper objects and which heaven gave us as the means of happiness not considering that the success of such an attempt is doubtful and that if they succeed they take from life all its sweetness and reduce it to a dull unactive round of tasteless days scarcely raised above vegetation if my ideas of things are right the human mind is naturally virtuous the business of education is therefore less to give us good impressions which we have from nature than to guard us against bad ones which are generally acquired 
And so ends my sermon. Adieu, my dear, your faithful A. Firma. A letter from your brother. I believe the dear creature is out of his wits. Emily has consented to marry him, and one would imagine by his joy that nobody was ever married before. He is going to Lake Champlain to fix on his seat of empire, or rather Emily's, for I see she will be the reigning queen, and he only Her Majesty's consort. I am going to Quebec. Two or three dry days have made the roads passable for summer carriages. Fitzgerald is come to fetch me. Adieu. Eight o'clock. I am come back, have seen Emily, who is the happiest woman existing. She has heard from your brother, and in such terms, his letter breathes the very soul of tenderness. I wish they were richer. I don't half relish their settling in Canada. But, rather than not live together, I believe they would consent to be set ashore on a desert island. Good night. End of section one. Section two of the History of Emily Montague, Volume three, by Francis Moore Brook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters 133-141 through 141. Letter 133 To the Earl of Blank, Sillery, April 25th The pleasure the mind finds in travelling has undoubtedly, my lord, its source in that love of novelty, that delight in acquiring new ideas, which is interwoven in its very frame which shows itself on every occasion from infancy to age which is the first passion of the human mind and the last there is nothing the mind of man abhors so much as a state of rest the great secret of happiness is to keep the soul in continual action without those violent exertions which wear out its powers and dull its capacity of enjoyment it should have exercise not labor Vice may justly be called the fever of the soul, inaction its lethargy, passion under the guidance of virtue its health. I have the pleasure to see my daughter's coquetry giving place to a tender affection for a very worthy man, who seems formed to make her happy. His fortune is easy, he is a gentleman and a man of worth and honor, and what perhaps inclines me to be more partial to him of my own profession. I mention the last circumstance in order to introduce a request that your lordship would have the goodness to employ that interest for him in the purchase of a majority, which you have so generously offered to me. I am determined, as there is no prospect of real duty, to quit the army and retire to that quiet which is so pleasing at my time of life. I am privately in treaty with a gentleman for my company, and propose returning to England in the first ship to give in my resignation. In this point, as well as that of serving Mr. Fitzgerald, I shall without scruple call upon your lordship's friendship. I have settled everything with Fitzgerald, but without saying a word to Bell, and he is to seduce her into matrimony as soon as he can, without my appearing at all interested in the affair. He is to ask my consent in form, though we have already settled every preliminary. All this, as well as my intention of quitting the army, is yet a secret to my daughter. But the questions your lordship does me the honor to ask me in regard to the Americans, I mean those of our old colonies. They appear to me, from all I have heard and seen of them, a rough, ignorant, positive, very selfish, yet hospitable people, strongly attached to their own opinions, but still more so to their interests, in regards to which they have inconceivable sagacity in address but in all other respects i think naturally inferior to the europeans as education does so much it is however difficult to ascertain this i am rather of opinion they would not have refused submission to the stamp act or disputed the power of the legislature at home had not their minds been first embittered by what touched their interests so nearly the restraints laid on their trade with the french and spanish settlements 
a trade by which england was an immense gainer and by which only a few enormously rich west india planters were hurt every advantage you give the north americans in trade centres at last in the mother country they are the bees who roam abroad for that honey which enriches the paternal hive taxing them immediately after their trade is restrained seems like drying up the source and expecting the stream to flow yet too much care cannot be taken to support the majesty of government and assert the dominion of the parent country a good mother will consult the interest and happiness of her children but will never suffer her authority to be disputed an equal mixture of mildness and spirit cannot fail of bringing these mistaken people misled by a few of violent temper and ambitious views into a just sense of their duty i have the honour to be my lord etc william fermor letter one hundred and thirty four to mrs temple pall mall may the fifth i have got my emily again to my great joy i am nobody without her as the roads are already very good we walk and ride perpetually and amuse ourselves as well as we can en attendant your brother who has gone a settlement hunting the quickness of vegetation in this country is astonishing though the hills are still covered with snow and though it even continues in spots in the valleys the latter with the trees and shrubs in the woods are already in beautiful verdure and the earth everywhere putting forth flowers in a wild and lovely variety and profusion tis amazingly pleasing to see the strawberries and wild pansies peeping their little foolish heads from beneath the snow emily and i are prodigiously fond after having been separated it is a divine relief to us both to have again the delight of talking of our lovers to each other we have been a month divided and neither of us have had the consolation of a friend to be foolish to fitzgerald dines with us he comes adieu yours a firmer letter one thirty five to the earl of blank sillery may fifth my lord i have been conversing if the expression is not improper when i have not had an opportunity of speaking a syllable more than two hours with a french officer who has declaimed the whole time with a most astonishing volubility without uttering one word which could either entertain or instruct his hearers and even without starting anything that deserved the name of a thought people who have no ideas out of the common road are i believe generally the greatest talkers because all their thoughts are low enough for common conversation whereas those of more elevated understandings have ideas which they cannot easily communicate except to persons of equal capacity with themselves this might be brought as an argument of the inferiority of women's understanding to ours as they are generally greater talkers if we did not consider the limited and trifling educations we give them men amongst other advantages have that of acquiring a greater variety as well as sublimity of ideas women who have conversed much with men are undoubtedly in general the most pleasing companions but this only shows of what they are capable when properly educated since they improve so greatly by that accidental and limited opportunity of acquiring knowledge indeed the two sexes are equal gainers by conversing with each other there is a mutual desire of pleasing in a mixed conversation restrained by politeness which sets every amiable quality in a stronger light bred in ignorance from one age to another women can learn little of their own sex i have often thought this the reason why officers daughters are in general more agreeable than other women in an equal rank of life i am almost tempted to bring bell as an instance but i know the blindness and partiality of nature and therefore check what paternal tenderness would dictate i am shocked at what your lordship tells me of miss h i know her imprudent i believe her virtuous a great flow of spirits has been ever hurrying her into indiscretions but allow me to say my lord it is particularly hard to fix the character by our conduct 
at a time of life when we are not competent judges of our own actions and when the hurry and vivacity of youth carries us to commit a thousand follies and indiscretions for which we blush when the empire of reason begins inexperience and openness of temper betray us in early life into improper connections in the very constancy and nobleness of nature which characterize the best hearts continue the delusion i know miss h perfectly and am convinced if her father will treat her as a friend and with the indulgent tenderness of affection endeavor to wean from her a choice so very unworthy of her he will infallibly secede and if he treats her with harshness she is lost forever he is too stern in his behavior too rigid in his morals it is the interest of virtue to be represented as she is lovely smiling and ever walking hand in hand with pleasure we were formed to be happy and to contribute to the happiness of our fellow creatures there are no real virtues but the social ones tis the enemy of humankind who has thrown around us the gloom of superstition and taught that austerity and voluntary misery are virtue if moralists would indeed improve human nature they should endeavour to expand not to contract the heart they should build their system on the passions and affections the only foundations of the nobler virtues from the partial representations of narrow-minded bigots who paint the deity from their own gloomy conceptions the young are too often frighted from the paths of virtue despairing of ideal perfections they give up all virtue as unattainable and start aside from the road which they falsely suppose strewed with thorns i have studied the heart with some attention and am convinced every parent who will take the pains to gain his children's friendship will forever be the guide and arbiter of their conduct i speak from a happy experience notwithstanding all my daughter says in gaiety of heart she would sooner even relinquish the man she loves than offend a father in whom she has always found the tenderest and most faithful of friends i am interrupted and have only time to say i have the honour to be my lord etc william fermore letter one hundred and thirty six to mrs temple pall mall Sillery, may the thirteenth madame de roche has just left us she returns to-day to the Camarascus. she came to take leave of us and shewed a concern at parting from emily which really affected me she is a most amiable woman emily and she were in tears at parting yet i think my sweet friend is not sorry for her return she loves her but yet cannot absolutely forget she has been her rival and is as well satisfied that she leaves quebec before your brother's arrival the weather is lovely the earth is in all its verdure the trees and foliage and no snow but on the sides of the mountains we are looking eagerly out for ships from dear england i expect by them volumes of letters from my lucy we expect your brother in a week in short we are all hope and expectation our hearts beat at every rap of the door supposing it brings intelligence of a ship or of the dear man fitzgerald takes such amazing pains to please me that i begin to think it is pity so much attention should be thrown away and am half inclined from mere compassion to follow the example you have so heroically set me absolutely lucy it requires amazing resolution to marry adieu yours a firmer letter one thirty seven to colonel rivers at montreal Sillery, may fourteenth i am returned my rivers to my sweet friend and have again the dear delight of talking of you without restraint she bears with she indulges me in all my weakness if that name ought to be given to a tenderness of which the object is the most exalted and worthy of his sex it was impossible i should not have loved you the soul that spoke in those eloquent eyes told me the first moment we met our hearts were formed for each other 
i saw in that amiable countenance a sensibility similar to my own but which i had till then sought in vain i saw there those benevolent smiles which are the marks and the emanations of virtue those thousand graces which ever accompany a mind conscious of its own dignity and satisfied with itself in short that mental beauty which is the express image of the deity what defence had i against you my rivers since your merit was such that my reason approved the weakness of my heart we have lost madame de roche we were both in tears at parting we embraced i pressed her to my bosom i love her my dear rivers i have an affection for her which i scarce know how to describe i saw her every day i found infinite pleasure in being with her she talked of you she praised you and my heart was soothed i however found it impossible to mention your name to her a reserve for which i cannot account i found pleasure in looking at her from the idea that she was dear to you that she felt for you the tenderest friendship do you know i think she has some resemblance of you there is something in her smile which gives me an idea of you shall i however own all my folly i never found this pleasure in seeing her when you were present on the contrary your attention to her gave me pain i was jealous of every look i even saw her amiable qualities with a degree of envy which checked the pleasure i should otherwise have found in her conversation there is always i fear some injustice mixed with love at least with love so ardent and tender as mine you my rivers will however pardon that injustice which is a proof of my excess of tenderness madame de roche has promised to write to me indeed i will love her i will conquer this little remain of jealousy and do justice to the most gentle and amiable of women why should i dislike her for seeing you with my eyes for having a soul whose feelings resemble my own i have observed her voice is softened and trembles like mine when she names you my rivers you were formed to charm the heart of a woman there is more pleasure in loving you even without the hope of a return than in the adoration of all your sex i pity every woman who is so insensible as to see you without tenderness this is the only fault i have ever found in belle firmer she has the most lively friendship for you but she has seen you without love of what materials must her heart be composed no other man can inspire the same sentiments with my rivers no other man can deserve them the delight of loving you appears to me so superior to all other pleasures that of all human beings if i was not emily montague i would be madame de roche i blush for what i have written yet why blush for having a soul to distinguish perfection or why conceal the real feelings of my heart i will never hide a thought from you you shall be at once the confidant and the dear object of my tenderness in what words my rivers you rule every emotion of my heart dispose as you please of your emily yet if you allow her to form a wish in opposition to yours indulge her in the transport of returning you to your friends let her receive you from the hands of a mother whose happiness you ought to prefer even to hers why will you talk of the mediocrity of your fortune have you not enough for every real want much less with you would make your emily blessed what have the trappings of life to do with happiness tis only sacrificing pride to love and filial tenderness the worst of human passions to the best i have a thousand things to say but am forced to steal this moment to write to you we have some french ladies here who are eternally coming to my apartment they are at the door adieu yours emily montague letter one hundred and thirty eight to the earl of blank silvery may twelfth it were indeed my lord to be wished that we had here schools at the expense of the public to teach english to the rising generation nothing is a stronger tie of brotherhood and affection a greater cement of union than speaking one common language 
the want of attention to the circumstance has i am told had the worst effects possible in the province of new york where the people especially at a distance from the capital continue to speak dutch retain their affection for their ancient masters and still look on their english fellow-subjects as strangers and intruders the canadians are the more easily to be won to this or whatever else their own or the general good requires as their noblesse have the strongest attachment to a court and that favour is the great object of their ambition were english made by degrees the court language it would soon be universally spoke of the three great springs of the human heart interest pleasure vanity the last appears to me much the strongest in the canadians and i am convinced the most forcible tie their noblesse have to france is their unwillingness to part with their croix de saint louis might not therefore some order of the same kind be instituted for canada and given to all who have the croix or their sending back the ensigns they now wear which are inconsistent with their allegiance as british subjects might not such an order be contrived to be given at the discretion of the governor as well to the canadian gentlemen who merit it most of the government as to the english officers of a certain rank and such other english as purchased estates and settled in the country and to give it additional lustre the governor for the time being be always head of the order tis possible something of the same kind all over america might be also of service the passions of mankind are nearly the same everywhere at least i never yet saw the soil or climate where vanity did not grow and till all mankind become philosophers it is by their passions they must be governed the common people by whom i mean the peasantry have been great gainers here by the change of masters their property is more secure their independence greater their profits much more than doubled it is not them therefore whom it is necessary to gain the noblesse on the contrary have been in a great degree undone they have lost their employs their rank their consideration and many of them their fortunes it is therefore equally consonant to good policy and to humanity that they should be considered and in the way most acceptable to them the rich conciliated by little honorary distinctions those who are otherwise by sharing in all lucrative employs and all of them by bearing a part in the legislature of their country the great objects here seem to be to heal those wounds which past unhappy disputes have left still in some degree open to unite the french and english the civil and the military in one firm body to raise a revenue to encourage agriculture and especially the growth of hemp and flax and find a staple for the improvement of a commerce which at present labours under a thousand disadvantages but i shall say little on this or any political subject relating to canada for a reason which whilst i am in this colony it would look like flattery to give let it suffice to say that humanly speaking it is impossible that the inhabitants of this province should be otherwise than happy i have the honour to be my lord etc william fermor letter one hundred and thirty nine to mrs temple pall mall Sillery, may the twentieth i confess the fact my dear i am thanks to papa amazingly learned and all that for a young lady of twenty-two yet you will allow i am not the worst no creature breathing would ever find it out envy itself must confess i talk of lace and blonde like another christian woman i have been thinking lucy as indeed my ideas are generally a little pindaric how entertaining and improving would be the history of the human heart if people spoke all the truth and painted themselves as they really are that is to say if all the world were as sincere and honest as i am for upon my word i have such a contempt for hypocrisy that upon the whole i have always appeared to have fewer good qualities than i really have i am afraid we should find in the best characters if we withdrew the veil a mixture of errors and inconsistencies which would greatly lessen our veneration 
Papa has been reading me a wise lecture this morning on playing the fool. I reminded him that I was now arrived at years of indiscretion, that everybody must have their day, and that those who did not play the fool young ran a hazard of doing it when it would not half so well become them. Apropos to playing the fool, I am strongly inclined to believe I shall marry. Fitzgerald is so astonishingly pressing. Besides, somehow or other, I don't feel happy without him. The creature has something of a magnetic virtue. I find myself generally, without knowing it, on the same side of the room with him, and often in the next chair and lay a thousand little schemes to be of the same party at cards. I write pretty sentiments in my pocket-book, and carve his name on trees when nobody sees me. Did you think it possible I could be such an idiot? I am as absurd as even the gentle lovesick Emily. I'm thinking, my dear, how happy it is, since most human beings differ so extremely from one another that heaven has given us the same variety in our tastes. Your brother is a divine fellow, and yet there is a sauciness about Fitzgerald which pleases me better. As he has told me a thousand times, he thinks me infinitely more agreeable than Emily. Adieu, I'm going to Quebec. Yours, A. Firma. Letter 140 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, May the 20th, Evening I owe Triumphy, a ship from England. You can have no idea of the universal transport at the sight. The whole town was on the beach, eagerly gazing at the charming stranger who danced gaily on the waves as if conscious of the pleasure she inspired. If our joy is so great to preserve a correspondence with Europe through our other colonies during the winter, what must that of the French have been, who were absolutely shut up six months from the rest of the world? I can scarce conceive a higher delight than they must have felt at thus being restored to a communication with mankind. The letters are not delivered. Our servant stays for them at the post office. We expect him every moment. If I have not volumes from you, I shall be very angry. He comes. Adieu. I have not patience to wait their being brought upstairs. Yours, A. Firma. They are here. Six letters from you. I shall give three of them to Emily to read whilst I read the rest. You are very good, Lucy, and I will never call you lazy again. Letter 141 To Miss Fermor at Soleri, Pall Mall, April 8. Whilst I was sealing my letter, I received yours of the 1st of February. I am excessively alarmed, my dear, at the account it gives me of Miss Montague's having broke with her lover, and of my brother's extreme affection for her. I did not dare to let my mother see that letter, as I am convinced the very idea of a marriage which must for ever separate her from a son she loves to idolatry would be fatal to her. She has altered since its leaving England more than you can imagine. She has grown pale and thin. Her vivacity has entirely left her. Even my marriage scarce seemed to give her pleasure. Yet such is her delicacy— her ardour for his happiness, she will not suffer me to say this to him, lest it should constrain him, and prevent his making himself happy in his own way. I often find her in tears in her apartment. She affects a smile when she sees me, but it is a smile which cannot deceive one who knows her whole soul as I do. In short, I am convinced she will not live long unless my brother returns." she never names him without being softened to a degree not to be expressed amiable and lovely as you represent this charming woman and great as the sacrifice is she has made to my brother 
it seems almost cruelty to wish to break his attachment to her yet situated as they are what can be the consequence of their indulging their tenderness at present but ruin to both at all events however my dear i entreat i conjure you to press my brother's immediate return to england i am convinced my mother's life depends on seeing him i have often been tempted to write miss montague to use her influence with him even against herself if she loves him she will have his true happiness at heart she will consider what a mind like his must hereafter suffer should his fondness for her be fatal to the best of mothers she will urge she will oblige him to return and make this step the condition of preserving her tenderness read this letter to her and tell her it is to her affection for my brother to her generosity i trust for the life of a parent who is dearer to me than my existence tell her my heart is hers that i will receive her as my guardian angel that we will never part that we will be friends that we will be sisters that i will omit nothing possible to make her happy with my brother in england and that i have very rational hopes it may be in time accomplished but that if she marries him in canada and suffers him to pursue his present design she plants a dagger in the bosom of her who gave him life i scarce know what i would say my dear bell but i am wretched i have no hope but in you yet if emily is all you represent her i am obliged to break off my mother is here she must not see this letter adieu your affectionate lucy temple end of section two section three of the history of emily montague volume three by francis moore brooke this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org letters one forty two through one fifty one letter one hundred and forty two to mrs temple pall mall salary may the twenty first your letter of the eighth of april my dear was first read by emily being one of the three i gave her for that purpose as i before mentioned she went through it and melting into tears left the room without speaking a word she has been writing this morning and i fancy to you for she inquired when the mail set out for england and seemed pleased to hear it went to-day I am excessively shocked at your account of Mrs. Rivers. Assure her in my name of your brother's immediate return. I know both him and Emily too well to believe they will sacrifice her to their own happiness. There is nothing on the contrary they will not suffer rather than even afflict her. Do not, however, encourage an idea of ever breaking an attachment like theirs an attachment founded less in passion than in the tenderest friendship in a similarity of character and a sympathy the most perfect the world ever saw let it be your business my lucy to endeavour to make them happy and to remove the bars which prevent their union in england and depend on seeing them there the very moment their coming is possible from what i know of your brother i suppose he will insist on marrying emily before he leaves quebec but after your letter which i shall send him you may look on his return as infallible i send all yours and temple's letters for your brother to-day you may expect to hear from him by the same mail with this i have only to say i am a firmer letter one four three to Colonel Rivers at Quebec, London, April 8. My own happiness, my dear Rivers, in a marriage of love, makes me extremely unwilling to prevent your giving way to a tenderness which promises you the same felicity with so amiable a woman as both you and Belle Fermor represent Miss Montague to be 
but my dear ned i cannot without betraying your friendship and hazarding all the quiet of your future days dispense with myself from telling you though i have her express commands to the contrary that the peace perhaps the life of your excellent mother depends on your giving up all thoughts of a settlement in america and returning immediately to england i know the present state of your affairs will not allow you to marry this charming woman here without descending from the situation you have ever held and which you have a right from birth to hold in this world would you allow me to gratify my friendship for you and show at the same time your perfect esteem for me by commanding what a long affection gives you a right to such a part of my fortune as i could easily spare without the least inconvenience to myself we might all be happy and you might make your emily so but you have already convinced me by your refusal of a former request of this kind that your esteem for me is much less warm than mine for you and that you do not think i merit the delights of making you happy i will therefore say no more on this subject till we meet than that i have no doubt this letter will bring you immediately to us if the tenderness you express for miss montague is yet conquerable it will surely be better for both it should be conquered as fortune has been so much less kind to each of you than nature but if your hearts are immovably fixed on each other if your love is of the kind which despises every other consideration return to the bosom of friendship and depend on our finding some way to make you happy if you persist in refusing to share my fortune you can have no objection to my using all my interest for a friend and brother so deservedly dear to me and in whose happiness i shall ever find my own allow me now to speak of myself i mean of my dearer self your amiable sister for whom my tenderness instead of decreasing grows every moment stronger yes my friend my sweet lucy is every hour more an angel her desire of being beloved renders her a thousand times more lovely a countenance animated by true tenderness will always charm beyond all the dead uninformed features the hand of nature ever framed love embellishes the whole form gives spirit to the softness of the eyes the most vivid bloom to the complexion dignity to the air grace to every motion and throws round beauty almost the rays of divinity in one word my lucy was always more lovely than any other woman she is now more lovely than even her former self you my rivers will forgive the overflowings of my fondness because you know the merits of its object adieu we die to embrace you your faithful j temple letter 144 to mrs temple paul mall Soleri, may 21st your letter madam to miss firmer which by an accident was first read by me has removed the veil which love had placed before mine eyes and showed me in one moment the folly of all those dear hopes i had indulged you do me but justice in believing me incapable of suffering your brother to sacrifice the peace much less the life of an amiable mother to my happiness i have no doubt of his returning to england the moment he receives your letters but knowing his tenderness 
I will not expose him to a struggle on this occasion. I will myself, unknown to him, as he is fortunately absent, embark in a ship which has wintered here, and will leave Quebec in ten days. Your invitation is very obliging, but a moment's reflection will convince you of the extreme impropriety of my accepting it. Assure Mrs. Rivers that her son will not lose a moment, that he will probably be with her as soon as this letter. Assure her also that the woman who has kept him from her can never forgive herself for what she suffers. I am too much afflicted to say more than that. I am, Madam, Emily Montague. Letter 145 To Miss Montague at Sillery, Montreal, May 20. It is with a pleasure no words can express, I tell my sweet Emily. I have fixed on a situation which promises every advantage we can wish as to profit, and which has every beauty that nature can give. The land is rich, and the wood will more than pay the expense of clearing it. There is a settlement within a few leagues on which there is an extreme agreeable family. A number of Acadians have applied to me to be received as settlers. In short, my dear angel, all seems to smile on our design i have spent some days at the house of a german officer lately in our service who is engaged in the same design but a little advanced in it i have seen him increasing every hour his little domain by clearing the lands he has built a pretty house in a beautiful rustic style i have seen his pleasing labours with inconceivable delight i already fancy my own settlement advancing in beauty i paint to myself my emily adorning those lovely shades i see her like the mother of mankind admiring a new creation which smiles around her we appear to my idea like the first pair in paradise i hope to be with you the first of june will you allow me to set down this second as the day which is to assure to me a life of happiness my acadians your new subjects are waiting in the next room to speak with me all good angels guard my emily adieu your ed rivers letter one hundred and forty six to Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, Celery, May the 24th. Emily has wrote to you, and appears more composed. She does not, however, tell me what she has resolved, and has only mentioned the design of spending a week at Quebec. I suppose she will take no resolution till your brother comes down. He cannot be here in less than ten days. She has heard from him, and he has fixed on a settlement depend however on his return to england even if it is not to stay i wish he could prevail on mrs rivers to accompany him back the advantages of his design are too great to lose the voyage is nothing the climate healthy beyond all conception i fancy he will marry as soon as he comes down from montreal set off in the first ship for england leave emily with me and return to us next year at least this is the plan my heart has formed i wish mrs rivers had borne his absence better her impatience to see him has broken in on all our schemes emily and i had in fancy formed a little eden on lake champlain fitzgerald had promised me to apply for lands near them we should have been so happy in our little new world of friendship there is nothing certain in this vile state of existence i could philosophize extremely well this morning all our little plans of amusement too for this summer are now at an end your brother was the soul of all our parties this is a trifle but my mind to-day seeks for every subject of chagrin let but my emily be happy and i will not complain even if i lose her i have a thousand fears a thousand uneasy reflections if you knew her merit you would not wish to break the attachment my sweet emily is going this morning to quebec i have promised to accompany her and she now waits for me i cannot write i have a heaviness about my heart which has never left me since i read your letter it is the only disagreeable one I ever received from my dear Lucy. I am not sure I love you so well as before I saw this letter. 
There is something unfeeling in the style of it, which I did not expect from you. Adieu, your faithful A. Firmer. Letter 147 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, Sillery, May the 25th. I am unhappy beyond all words. My sweet Emily is gone to England. The ship sailed this morning. I am just returned from the beach after conducting her on board. I used every art, every persuasion in the power of friendship to prevent her going till your brother came down. But all I said was in vain. She told me she knew too well her own weakness to hazard seeing him, that she also knew his tenderness, and was resolved to spare him the struggle between his affection and his duty, that she was determined never to marry him but with the consent of his mother, that their meeting at Quebec, situated as they were, could only be the source of unhappiness to both, that her heart doted on him, but that she would never be the cause of his acting in a manner unworthy his character, that she would see his family the moment she got to London, and then retire to the house of a relation in Berkshire, where she would wait for his arrival. That she had given you her promise, which nothing should make her break, to embark in the first ship for England. She expressed no fears for herself as to the voyage, but trembled at the idea of her rivers in danger. She sat down several times yesterday to write to him, but her tears prevented her. She at last assumed courage enough to tell him her design, but it was in such terms as convinced me she could not have pursued it had he been here. She went to the ship with an appearance of calmness that astonished me, but the moment she entered, all her resolution forsook her. She retired with me to her room, where she gave way to all the agony of her soul. The word was given to sail. I was summoned away. She rose hastily. She pressed me to her bosom. Tell him, said she, his Emily. She could say no more. Never in my life did I feel any sorrow equal to this separation. Love her, my Lucy. You can never have half the tenderness for her she merits. She stood on the deck till the ship turned Point Levi, her eyes fixed passionately on our boat. Twelve o'clock. I have this moment a letter from your brother to Emily, which she directed me to open, and send to her. I enclose it to you as the safest way of conveyance. There is one in it from Temple to him on the same subject with yours to me. Adieu, I will write again when my mind is more composed. Yours, A. Firmer. Letter 148 to Miss Montague at Soleri, Montreal, May 28. It was my wish, my hope, my noblest ambition, my dear Emily, to see you in a situation worthy of you. My sanguine temper flattered me with the idea of seeing this wish accomplished in Canada, though fortune denied it me in England. The letter which I enclose has put an end to those fond delusive hopes. I must return immediately to England. Did not my own heart dictate this step? I know too well the goodness of yours to expect the continuance of your esteem were i capable of purchasing happiness even the happiness of calling you mine at the expense of my mother's life or even of her quiet i must now submit to see my emily in an humbler situation to see her want those pleasures those advantages those honours which fortune gives and which she has so nobly sacrificed to true delicacy of mind and if i do not flatter myself to her generous and disinterested affection for me he assured my dearest angel the inconveniencies attendant on a narrow fortune the only one i have to offer shall be softened by all which the most lively esteem the most perfect friendship the tenderest love can inspire by that attention that unwearied solicitude to please of which the heart alone knows the value 
fortune has no power over minds like ours we possess a treasure to which all she has to give is nothing the dear exquisite delight of loving and of being beloved awake to all the finer feelings of tender esteem and elegant desire we have every real good in each other i shall hurry down the moment i have settled my affairs here and hope soon to have the transport of presenting the most charming of friends of mistresses allow me to add of wives to a mother whom i love and revere beyond words and to whom she will soon be dearer than myself my going to england will detain me at montreal a few days longer than i intended a delay i can very ill support adieu my emily no language can express my tenderness or my impatience your faithful ed rivers letter one hundred and forty nine to john temple esq pall mall montreal may twenty eighth i cannot enough my dear temple thank you for your last though it destroys my air-built scheme of happiness could i have supposed my mother would thus severely have felt my absence i had never left england to make her easier was my only motive for that step i would with pleasure sacrifice my design of settling here to her peace of mind no consideration however shall ever make me give up that of marrying the best and most charming of women i could have wished to have had a fortune worthy of her this was my wish not that of my emily she will with equal pleasure share with me poverty or riches i hope her consent to marry me before i leave canada i know the advantages of affluence my dear temple and am too reasonable to despise them i would only avoid rating them above their worth riches undoubtedly purchase a variety of pleasures which are not otherwise to be obtained they give power they give honours they give consequence but if to enjoy these subordinate goods we must give up those which are more essential more real more suited to our natures i can never hesitate one moment to determine between them i know nothing fortune has to bestow which can equal the transport of being dear to the most amiable most lovely of womankind the stream of life my dear temple stagnates without the gentle gale of love till i knew my emily till the dear moment which assured me of her tenderness i could scarce be said to live adieu your affectionate ed rivers letter one hundred and fifty to mrs temple pall mall Sillery, june the first i can write i can talk of nothing but emily i never knew how much i loved her till she was gone i run eagerly to every place where we have been together every spot reminds me of her i remember a thousand conversations endeared by confidence and affection a tender tear starts in spite of me our walks our airings our pleasing little parties all rush at once on my memory i see the same lovely scenes around me but they have lost half their power of pleasing i visit every grove every thicket that she loved i have a redoubled fondness for every object in which she took pleasure fitzgerald indulges me in this enthusiasm of friendship he leads me to every place which can recall my emily's idea he speaks of her with a warmth which shews the sensibility and goodness of his own heart he endeavours to soothe me with by the most endearing attention what infinite pleasure my dear lucy there is in being truly beloved fond as i have ever been of general admiration that of all mankind is nothing to the least mark of fitzgerald's tenderness adieu it will be some days before i can send this letter june the fourth the governor gives a ball in honour of the day i am dressing to go but without my sweet companion every hour i feel more sensibly her absence fifth we had last night during the ball the most dreadful storm i ever heard it seemed to shake the whole habitable globe heaven preserve my emily from its fury i have a thousand fears on her account twelve o'clock your brother is arrived he has been here about an hour he flew to Sillery without going at all to quebec he inquired for emily 
he would not believe she was gone. There is no expressing how much he was shocked when convinced she had taken this voyage without him. He would have followed her in an open boat, in hopes of overtaking her at Kudra, if my father had not detained him almost by force, and at last convinced him of the impossibility of overtaking her, as the winds, having been constantly fair, must before this have carried them out of the river. He had sent his servant to Quebec with orders to take passage for him in the first ship that sails. His impatience is not to be described. He came down in the hope of marrying her here and conducting her himself to England. He forms to himself a thousand dangers to her, which he fondly fancies his presence could have averted. In short, he has all the unreasonableness of a man in love. I propose sending this, and a large packet more, by your brother, unless some unexpected opportunity offers before. Adieu, my dear, yours, A. Firmer. Letter 151 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, 6th Your brother has taken his passage in a very fine ship, which will sail the 10th. You may expect him every hour after you receive this, which I send, with what I wrote yesterday, by a small vessel which sails a week sooner than was intended. Rivers persuades Fitzgerald to apply for the land which he had fixed upon on Lake Champlain, as he has no thoughts of ever returning hither. I will prevent this, however, if I have any influence. I cannot think with patience of continuing in America when my two amiable friends have left it. I had no motive for wishing a settlement here but to form a little society of friends, of which they made the principal part. Besides, a spirit of emulation would have kept up my courage and given fire and brilliancy to my fancy. Emily and I should have been trying who had the most lively genius at creation. Who could have produced the fairest flowers? Who have formed the woods and rocks in the most beautiful arbors, vistas, grottoes? Have taught the streams to flow in the most pleasing meanders? Have brought into view the greatest number and variety of those lovely little falls of water with which this fairyland abounds? And shewed nature in the fairest form? In short, we should have been continually endeavouring following the luxuriancy of female imagination, to render more charming the sweet abodes of love and friendship, whilst our heroes, changing their swords into ploughshares, and engaged in more substantial, more profitable labours, were clearing land, raising cattle and corn, and doing everything becoming good farmers, or, to express it more poetically, taming the genius of the stubborn plain almost as quickly as they conquered Spain, by which I would be understood to me in the Havana, where, vanity apart, I am told both of them did their duty, and a little more, if a man can in such a case be said to do more. In one word, they would have been studying the useful, to support us, we the agreeable to please and amuse them, which I take to be assigning to the two sexes the employments for which nature intended them, notwithstanding the vile example of the savages to the contrary. There are now no farmeresses in Canada worth my contending with. Therefore, the whole pleasure of the thing would be at an end, even on the supposition that friendship had not been the soul of our design. Say everything to me to Temple and Mrs. Rivers, and to my dearest Emily, if arrived. Adieu, your faithful A. Firmer. End section three. Section four of the History of Emily Montague, Volume three, by Francis Moore Brooke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters 152 through 159 Letter 152 
to the Earl of Blank, Sillery, June 6, 1776. It is very true, my lord, that the Jesuit missionaries still continue in the Indian villages in Canada, and I am afraid it is no less true that they use every art to instill into those people an aversion to the English. At least I have been told this by the Indians themselves, who seem equally surprised and piqued that we do not send missionaries amongst them. Their ideas of Christianity are extremely circumscribed, and they give no preference to one mode of our faith above another. They regard a missionary of any nation as a kind father who comes to instruct them in the best way of worshipping the deity, whom they suppose more propitious to the Europeans than to themselves, and as an ambassador from the prince whose subject he is. They therefore think it a mark of honor and a proof of esteem to receive missionaries, and to our remissiveness and the French wise attention on this head is owing the extreme attachment the greater part of the savage nation have ever had to the latter. The French missionaries, by studying their language, their manners, their tempers, their dispositions, by conforming to their way of life and using every art to gain their esteem, have acquired an influence over them which is scarce to be conceived, nor would it be difficult for ours to do the same, were they judiciously chose and properly encouraged. I believe I have said that there is a striking resemblance between the manners of the Canadians and the savages. I should have explained it by adding that this resemblance has been brought about not by the French having won the savages to receive European manners, but by the very contrary, the peasants having acquired the savage indolence in peace, their activity and ferocity in war, their fondness for field sports, their hatred of labor, their love of a wandering life and of liberty, in the latter of which they have been in some degree indulged, the laws here being much milder and more favorable to the people than in France. Many of the officers also, and those of rank in the colony troops, have been adopted into the savage tribes, and there is stronger evidence than for the honor of humanity, I would wish there was, that some of them have led the death dance at the execution of English captives, have even partook the horrid repast and imitated them in all their cruelties, cruelties which to the eternal disgrace not only of our holy religion, but even of our nature, these poor people whose ignorance is their excuse have been instigated to both by the french and english colonies who with a fury truly diabolical have offered rewards to those who brought in the scalps of their enemies rousseau has taken great pains to prove that the most uncultivated nations are the most virtuous i have all due respect for this philosopher of whose writings i am an enthusiastic admirer but i have a still greater respect for truth which I believe is not in this instance on his side. There is little reason to boast of the virtues of a people who are such brutal slaves to their appetites as to be unable to avoid drinking brandy to an excess scarce to be conceived whenever it falls in their way, though eternally lamenting the murders and other atrocious crimes of which they are so perpetually guilty when under its influence. It is unjust to say we have corrupted them, that we have taught them a vice to which we are ourselves not addicted. Both French and English are in general sober. We have indeed given them the means of intoxication, which they had not before their intercourse with us. But he must be indeed fond of praising them, who makes a virtue of their having been sober, when water was the only liquor with which they were acquainted. From all that I have observed and heard of these people, it appears to me an undoubted fact that the most civilized Indian nations are the most virtuous, a fact which makes directly against Rousseau's ideal system. Indeed, all systems make against, instead of leading to, the discovery of truth. Père Lafitau has, for this reason, in his very learned comparison of the manners of the savages with those of the first ages, given a very imperfect account of Indian manners. He is even so candid as to own he tells you nothing but what makes for the system he is endeavoring to establish. My wish, on the contrary, is not to make truth subservient to any favorite sentiment or idea, any child of my fancy, 
but to discover it whether agreeable or not to my own opinion my accounts may therefore be false or imperfect from mistake or misinformation but will never be designedly warped from truth that the savages have virtues candor must own but only a love of paradox can make any man assert that they have more than polished nations your lordship asks me what is the general moral character of the canadians they are simple and hospitable yet extremely attentive to interest where it does not interfere with that laziness which is their governing passion they are rather devout than virtuous have religion without morality and a sense of honour without very strict honesty indeed i believe wherever superstition reigns the moral sense is greatly weakened the strongest inducement to the practice of morality is removed when people are brought to believe that a few outward ceremonies will compensate for the want of virtue i myself heard a man who had raised a large fortune by very indirect means confess his life had been contrary to every precept of the gospel but that he hoped the pardon of heaven for all his sins as he intended to devote one of his daughters to a conventual life as an expiation this way of being virtuous by proxy is certainly very easy and convenient to such sinners as we have children to sacrifice by colonel rivers who leaves us in a few days i intend myself the honour of addressing your lordship again i have the honour to be your lordships etc william fermore letter one hundred and fifty three to the earl of blank Sillery, june ninth your lordship will receive this from the hands of one of the most worthy and amiable men i ever knew colonel rivers whom i am particularly happy in having the honour to introduce to your lordship as i know your delicacy in the choice of friends and that there are so few who have your perfect esteem and confidence that the acquaintance of one who merits both at his time of life will be regarded even by your lordship as an acquisition tis to him i shall say the advantage i procure him by making him known to a nobleman who with the wisdom and experience of age has all the warmth of heart the generosity the noble confidence the enthusiasm the fire and vivacity of youth your lordship's idea in regard to protestant convents here on the footing of that we visited together at hamburg is extremely well worth the consideration of those whom it may concern especially if the romish ones are abolished as will most probably be the case the noblesse have numerous families and if there are no convents will be at a loss where to educate their daughters as well as where to dispose of those who do not marry in a reasonable time the convenience they find in both respects from these houses is one strong motive to them to continue in their ancient religion as i would however prevent the more useful by which i mean the lower part of the sex from entering into this state i would wish only the daughters of the seigneurs to have the privilege of becoming nuns they should be obliged on taking the vow to prove their noblesse for at least three generations which would secure them respect and at the same time prevent their becoming too numerous they should take the vow of obedience but not of celibacy and reserve the power as at hamburg of going out to marry though on no other consideration your lordship may remember every nun at hamburg has a right of marrying except the abbess and that on your lordship's telling the lady who then presided and who was young and very handsome you thought this a hardship she answered with great spirit o oh, my lord you know it is in my power to resign i refer your lordship to colonel rivers for that farther information in regard for this colony which he is much more able to give you than i am having visited every part of canada and the design of settling in it i have the honour to be my lord etc william fermore your lordship's mention of nuns has brought to my memory a little anecdote on this subject which i will tell you i was a few mornings ago visiting a french lady whose very handsome daughter of almost sixteen told me she was going into a convent i inquired which she made choice of she said the general hospital i am glad mademoiselle you have not chosen the ursulines 
the rules are so very severe you would have found them hard to conform to as to the rules sir i have no objection to their severity but the habit of the general hospital i smiled is so very light and so becoming mademoiselle she smiled in her turn and i left her fully convinced of the sincerity of her vocation and the great propriety and humanity of suffering young creatures to choose a kind of life so repugnant to human nature at an age when they are such excellent judges of what will make them happy letter one hundred and fifty four to mrs temple pall mall Soleri, june the ninth i sent this by your brother who sails to-morrow time i hope will reconcile me to his and emily's absence but at present i cannot think of losing them without a dejection of mind which takes from me the very idea of pleasure i conjure you my dear lucy to do everything possible to facilitate their union and remember that to your request and to mrs rivers's tranquillity they have sacrificed every prospect they had of happiness i would say more but my spirits are so affected i am incapable of writing love my sweet emily and let her not repent the generosity of her conduct adieu your affectionate a firmer letter one hundred and fifty five to mrs temple pall mall Soleri, june the tenth evening my poor rivers i think i felt more from his going than even from emily's whilst he was here i seemed not quite to have lost her i now feel doubly the loss of both he begged me to shew attention to madame de roche who he assured me merited my tenderest friendship he wrote to her and has left the letter open in my care it is to thank her in the most affectionate terms for her politeness and friendship as well as to himself as to his emily and to offer her his best services in england in regard to her estate part of which some people here have very ungenerously applied for a grant of on pretence of its not being all settled according to the original conditions he owned to me he felt some regret at leaving this amiable woman in canada and at the idea of never seeing her more i still love him for this sensibility and for his delicate attention to one whose disinterested affection for him most certainly deserves it fitzgerald is below he does all possible to console me for the loss of my friends but indeed lucy i feel their absence most severely i have an opportunity of sending your brother's letter to madame de roche which i must not lose as they are not very frequent is by a french gentleman who is now with my father adieu your faithful a firmer twelve at night we have been talking of your brother i have been saying there is nothing i so much admire in him as that tenderness of soul and almost female sensibility which is so uncommon in the sex whose whole education tends to harden their hearts fitzgerald admires his spirit his understanding his generosity his courage the warmth of his friendship my father his knowledge of the world not that indiscriminate suspicion of mankind which is falsely so called but that clearness of mental sight and discerning faculty which can distinguish virtue as well as vice wherever it resides i also love in him said my father that noble sincerity that integrity of character which is the foundation of all the virtues and yet my dear papa you would have had emily prefer to him that white curd of ass's milk sir george clayton whose highest claim to virtue is the constitutional absence of vice and who never knew what it was to feel for the sorrows of another you mistake bell such a preference was impossible 
but she was engaged to Sir George, and he had also a fine fortune. Now, in these degenerate days, my dear, people must eat. We have lost all taste for the airy food of romances, when ladies rode behind their enamoured knights, dined luxuriously on a banquet of halls, and quenched their thirst at the first stream. But my dear papa, but my dear Belle, I saw the sweet old man look angry, so I chose to drop the subject. But I do aver, now he is out of sight, that halls and a pillion, with such a noble fellow as your brother, are preferable to Ortolans and a coach and six, with such a piece of still life and insipidity as Sir George. Good night, my dear Lucy. Letter 156 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, Soleri, June the 17th. I have this moment received a packet of letters from my dear Lucy. I shall only say, in answer to what makes the greatest part of them, that in a fortnight I hope you will have the pleasure of seeing your brother, who did not hesitate one moment in giving up to Mrs. Rivers's peace of mind, all his pleasing prospects here, and the happiness of being united to the woman he loved. You will not, I hope, my dear, forget his having made such a sacrifice, but I think too highly of you to say more on this subject. You will receive Emily as a friend, as a sister, who merits all your esteem and tenderness, and who has lost all the advantages of fortune, and incurred the censure of the world by her disinterested attachment to your brother. I am extremely sorry, but not surprised, at what you tell me of poor Lady H. I knew her intimately. She was sacrificed at eighteen by the avarice and ambition of her parents, to age, disease, ill-nature, and a coronet, and her death is the natural consequence of her regret. She had a soul formed for friendship. She found it not at home, her elegance of mind and native probity prevented her seeking it abroad. She died a melancholy victim to the tyranny of her friends, the tenderness of her heart, and her delicate sense of honour. If her father has any of the feelings of humanity left, what must he not suffer on this occasion? It is a painful consideration, my dear, that the happiness or misery of our lives are generally determined before we are proper judges of either. Restrained by custom and the ridiculous prejudices of the world, we go with the crowd, and it is late in life before we dare to think. How happy are you and I, Lucy, in having parents who, far from forcing our inclinations, have not even endeavoured to betray us into choosing from sordid motives. They have not laboured to fill our young hearts with vanity or avarice. They have left us those virtues, those amiable qualities we received from nature. They have painted to us the charms of friendship, and not taught us to value riches above their real price. My father, indeed, checks a certain excess of romance which there is in my temper, but at the same time he never encouraged my receiving the addresses of any man who had only the gifts of fortune to recommend him. He even advised me, when very young, against marrying an officer in his regiment, of a large fortune, but an unworthy character. If I have any knowledge of the human heart, it will be my own fault if I am not happy with Fitzgerald. I am only afraid that when we are married, and begin to settle into a calm, my volatile disposition will carry me back to coquetry. My passion for admiration is naturally strong, and has been increased by indulgence. For, without vanity, I have been extremely the taste of the men. I have a kind of an idea, it won't be long before I try the strength of my resolution, for I heard Papa and Fitzgerald in high consultation this morning. Do you know that 
having nobody to love but Fitzgerald, I am ten times more enamoured of the dear creature than ever. My love is now like the rays of the sun collected. He is so much here, I wonder I don't grow tired of him. But somehow he has the art of varying himself beyond any man I ever knew. It was that agreeable variety of character that first struck me. I consider that with him I should have all the sex in one. He says the same of me. And indeed, it must be owned, we have both an infinity of agreeable caprice, which in love affairs is worth all the merit in the world. Have you never observed, Lucy, that the same person is seldom greatly the object of both love and friendship? Those virtues which command esteem do not often inspire passion. Friendship seeks the more real, more solid virtues, integrity, constancy, and a steady uniformity of character. Love, on the contrary, admires it knows not what, creates itself the idol it worships, finds charms even in defects, is pleased with follies, with inconsistency with caprice to say all in one line love is a child and like a child he plays the moment emily arrives i entreat that one of you will write to me no words can speak my impatience i am equally anxious to hear of my dear rivers heaven send them prosperous gales adieu your faithful a firmer Letter 157 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, Sillery, June the 30th You are extremely mistaken, my dear, in your idea of the society here. I had rather live at Quebec, take it for all in all, than in any town in England, except London. The manner of living here is uncommonly agreeable. The scenes about us are lovely and the mode of amusement make us taste those scenes in full perfection. Whilst your brother and Emily were here, I had not a wish to leave Canada, but their going has left a void in my heart, which will not easily be filled up. I have loved Emily almost from childhood, and there is a peculiar tenderness in those friendships, which grow with our growth and strengthen with our strength. There was also something romantic and agreeable in finding her here, and unexpectedly, after we had been separated by Colonel Montague's having left the regiment in which my father served. In short, everything concurred to make us dear to each other, and therefore to give a greater poignancy to the pain of parting the second time. As to your brother... I love him so much that a man who had less candour and generosity than Fitzgerald would be almost angry at my very lively friendship. I have this moment a letter from Madame de Roche. She laments the loss of our two amiable friends, begs me to assure them both of her eternal remembrance, says she congratulates Emily on possessing the heart of the man on earth most worthy of being beloved that she cannot form an idea of any human felicity equal to that of the woman the business of whose life it is to make Colonel Rivers happy, that, heaven having denied her that happiness, she will never marry nor enter into an engagement which would make it criminal in her to remember him with tenderness, that it is, however, she believes best for her he has left the country, for that it is impossible she should ever have seen him with a difference. It is perhaps as prudent not to mention these circumstances either to your brother or Emily. I thought of sending her letter to them, but there is a certain fire in her style, mixed with tenderness, when she speaks of rivers, which would only have given them both regret by making them see the excess of her affection for him. Her expressions are much stronger than those in which I have given you the sense of them. I intend to be very intimate with her, because she loves my dear Rivers. She loves Emily, too. At least she fancies she does. But I am a little doubtful as to the friendships between rivals, 
At this distance, however, I dare say, they will always continue on the best terms possible, and I would have Emily write to her. Do you know she has desired me to contrive to get her a picture of your brother without his knowing it? I am not determined whether I shall indulge her in this fancy or not. If I do, I must employ you as my agent. It is madness in her to desire it, but, as there is a pleasure in being mad, I am not sure my morality will let me refuse her, since pleasures are not very thick sown in this world. Adieu, your affectionate A. Firmer. Letter 158 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, Sillery, July the 10th by this time my dear lucy i hope you are happy with your brother and my sweet emily i am all impatient to know this from yourselves but it will be five or six weeks perhaps much more before i can have that satisfaction as to me to be plain my dear i can hold no longer i have been married this fortnight my father wanted to keep it a secret for some very foolish reasons, but it is not in my nature. I hate secrets. They are only fit for politicians and people whose thoughts and actions will not bear the light. For my part, I am convinced that the general loquacity of humankind and our inability to keep secrets without a natural kind of uneasiness were meant by providence to guard against our laying deep schemes of treachery against each other. I remember a very sensible man, who perfectly knew the world, used to say, there was no such thing in nature as a secret, a maxim as true, at least I believe so, as it is salutary, and which I would advise all good mamas, aunts and governesses to impress strongly on the minds of young ladies. So, as I was saying, voila, Madame Fitzgerald. This is, however, yet a secret here, but according to my present doctrine, and following the nature of things, it cannot long continue so. You never saw so polite a husband, but I suppose they are also the first fortnight, especially when married in so interesting and romantic a manner. I am very fond of the fancy of being thus married, as it were, but I have a notion I shall blunder it out very soon. We were married on a party to Three Rivers, nobody with us but Papa and Madame Villiers, who have not yet published the mystery. I hear some misses at Quebec are scandalous about Fitzgerald's being so much here. I will leave them in doubt a little, I think merely to gratify their love of scandal. Everybody should be amused in their way. Adieu, yours, A. Fitzgerald. Pray let Emily be married. Everybody married but poor little Emily. Letter 159 To the Earl of Blank Celeri, July 10th I have the pleasure to tell your lordship I have married my daughter to a gentleman with whom I have reason to hope she will be happy. He is the second son of an Irish baronet of good fortune, and has himself about five hundred pounds a year, independent of his commission. He is a man of excellent sense and of honour, and has a very lively tenderness for my daughter. It will, I am afraid, be some time before I can leave this country, as I choose to take my daughter and Mr. Fitzgerald with me, in order to the latter soliciting a majority in which pursuit i shall without scruple tax your lordship's friendship to the utmost i am extremely happy at this event as bell's volatile temper made me sometimes afraid of her choosing inconsiderately their marriage is not yet declared for some family reasons not worth particularizing to your lordship as soon as leave of absence comes from new york for me and mr fitzgerald we shall settle things for taking leave of canada which I, however, assure your lordship, I shall do with some reluctance. The climate is all the year agreeable and healthy, and summer divine. A man of my time of life cannot leave this 
cheering enlivening sun without reluctance the heat is very like that of italy or the south of france that oppressive closeness which generally attends our hot weather in england the manner of life here is cheerful we make the most of our fine summers by the pleasantest country parties you can imagine here are some very estimable persons and the spirit of urbanity begins to diffuse itself from the centre in short i shall leave canada at the very time when one would wish to come to it it is astonishing in a small community like this how much depends on the personal character of him who governs i am obliged to break off abruptly the person who takes this to england being going immediately on board i have the honour to be my lord your lordships etc william fermor end of section four section five of the history of emily montague volume three by francis moore brooke this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org letters one sixty through one sixty nine letter one hundred and sixty to john temple esq pall mall Sillery, july the thirteenth i agree with you my dear temple that nothing can be more pleasing than an awakened english woman of which you and my caro sposo have i flatter myself the happy experience and wish with you that the character was more common but i must own and i am sorry to own it that my fair countrywomen and fellow-citizens i speak of the nation in general and not of the capital have an unbecoming kind of reserve which prevents their being the agreeable companions and amiable wives which nature meant them from a fair and i think a prudish one of being thought too attentive to please your sex they have acquired a certain distant manner to men which borders on ill-breeding they take great pains to veil under an affected appearance of disdain that winning sensibility of heart that delicate tenderness which renders them doubly lovely they are even afraid to own their friendships if not according to the square and rule are doubtful whether a modest woman may own she loves even her husband and seem to think affections were given them for no purpose but to hide upon the whole with at least as good as a native right to charm as any women on the face of the globe the english have found the happy secret of pleasing less is my emily arrived i can say nothing else twelve o'clock i am the happiest woman in the creation papa has just told me we are to go home in six or seven weeks not but this is a divine country and our farm a terrestrial paradise but we have lived in it almost a year and one grows tired of everything in time you know temple i shall see my emily and flirt with rivers to say nothing of you and my dear lucy adieu i am grown very lazy since i married for the future i shall make fitzgerald write all my letters except billet doux in which i think i excel him yours a fitzgerald letter one sixty one to miss firmer at Soleri, dover july eight i am this moment arrived my dear bell after a very agreeable passage and am setting out immediately for london from whence i shall write to you the moment i have seen mrs rivers i will own to you i tremble at the idea of this interview yet am resolved to see her and open all my soul to her in regard to her son after which i shall leave her the mistress of my destiny for ardently as i love him i will never marry him but with her approbation i have a thousand anxious fears for my river safety may heaven protect him from the dangers his emily has escaped i have but a moment to write a ship being under way which is bound to quebec a gentleman who is just going off in a boat to the ship takes the care of this may every happiness attend my dear girl 
say everything affectionate for me to Captain Firmer and Mr. Fitzgerald. Adieu, yours, Emily Montague. Letter 162 To Miss Firmer at Solary, London, July 19. I got to town last night, my dear, and am at a friend's, from whence I have this morning sent to Mrs. Rivers. I every moment expect her answer. My anxiety of mind is not to be expressed. My heart sinks. I almost dread the return of my messenger. If the affections, my dear friend, give us the highest happiness of which we are capable, they are also the source of our keenest misery. What I feel at this instant is not to be described. I have been near resolving to go into the country without seeing or sending to Mrs. Rivers. If she should receive me with coldness, why should I have exposed myself to the chance of such a reception? It would have been better to have waited for Rivers' arrival. I have been too precipitate. My warmth of temper has misled me. What had I to do to seek his family? I would give the world to retract my message, though it was only to let her know I was arrived, that her son was well, and that she might every hour expect him in England. There is a rap at the door. I tremble, I know not why. The servant comes up. He announces Mr. and Mrs. Temple. My heart beats. They are at the door. One o'clock. They are gone and return for me in an hour. They insist on my dining with them and tell me Mrs. Rivers is impatient to see me. Nothing was ever so polite, so delicate, so affectionate as the behavior of both. They saw my confusion and did everything to remove it. They inquired after Rivers, but without the least hint of the dear interest I take in him. They spoke of the happiness of knowing me. They asked my friendship, in a manner the most flattering that can be imagined. How strongly does Mrs. Temple, my dear, resemble her amiable brother? Her eyes have the same sensibility, the same pleasing expression. I think I scarce ever saw so charming a woman. I love her already. I feel a tenderness for her which is inconceivable. I caught myself two or three times looking at her, with an attention for which I blushed. How dear to me is every friend of my rivers! I believe there was something very foolish in my behavior. But they had the good breeding and humanity not to seem to observe it. I had almost forgot to tell you they said everything obliging and affectionate of you and Captain Firmer. My mind is in a state not to be described. I feel joy, I feel anxiety, I feel doubt, I feel a timidity I cannot conquer at the thought of seeing Mrs. Rivers. I have to dress, therefore must finish this when I return. Twelve at night. I am come back, my dearest Belle. I have gone through the scene I so much dreaded, and am astonished I should ever think of it but with pleasure. How much did I injure this most amiable of women? Her reception of me was that of a tender parent who had found a long-lost child. She kissed me, she pressed me to her bosom. Her tears flowed in abundance. She called me her daughter, her other Lucy. She asked me a thousand questions of her son. She would know all that concerned him, however minute. How he looked, whether he talked much of her, what were his amusements, whether he was as handsome as when he left England. I answered her with some hesitation, but with a pleasure that animated my whole soul. I believe I never appeared to such advantage as this day. You will not ascribe it to an unmeaning vanity when I tell you I never took such pains to please. I even gave a particular attention to my dress that I might, as much as possible, justify my river's tenderness. I never was vain for myself, but I am so for him. I am indifferent to admiration as Emily Montague, but as the object of his love I would be admired by all the world. I wish to be the first of my sex in all that is amiable and lovely, that I might make a sacrifice worthy of my rivers in showing to all his friends that he only can inspire me with tenderness, that I live for him alone." Mrs. Rivers pressed me extremely to pass a month with her. My heart yielded too easily to her request, but I had courage to resist my own wishes as well as her solicitations, 
and shall set out in three days for Berkshire. I have, however, promised to go with them to-morrow, on a party to Richmond, which Mr. Temple was so obliging as to propose on my account. Late as the season is, there is one more ship going to Quebec, which sails to-morrow. You shall hear from me again, in a few days, by the packet. Adieu, my dearest friend. Your faithful, Emily Montague. Surely it will not be long before Rivers arrives. You, my dear Bill, will judge what must be my anxiety till that moment. Letter 163 to Captain Firmer at Soleri, Dover, July 24, 11 o'clock i am arrived my dear friend after a passage agreeable in itself but which my fears for emily made infinitely anxious and painful every wind that blew i trembled for her i formed to myself ideal dangers on her account which reason had not power to dissipate we had a very tumultuous head sea a great part of the voyage though the wind was fair a certain sign there had been stormy weather with a contrary wind i fancied my emily exposed to those storms there is no expressing what i suffered from this circumstance on entering the channel of england we saw an empty boat and some pieces of a wreck floating i fancied it part of the ship which conveyed my lovely emily a sudden chillness seized my whole frame my heart died within me at the sight i had scarce courage when i landed to inquire whether she was arrived i asked the question with a trembling voice and had the transport to find the ship had passed by and to hear the person of my emily described amongst the passengers who landed it was not easy to mistake her i hope to see her this evening what do i not feel from that dear hope chance gives me an opportunity of forwarding this by new york i write whilst my chaise is getting ready adieu yours ed rivers i shall write to my dear little bell as soon as i get to town there is no describing what i felt at first seeing the coast of england i saw the white cliffs with a transport mixed with veneration a transport which however was checked by my fears for the dearer part of myself my chaise is at the door adieu your faithful etc ed rivers letter one hundred and sixty four to miss firmer at Sillery, rochester july twenty four i am obliged to wait ten minutes for a canadian gentleman who is with me and has some letters to deliver here how painful is this delay but i cannot leave a stranger alone on the road though i lose so many minutes with my charming emily to soften this moment as much as possible i will begin a letter to my dear bell our sweet emily is safe i wrote to captain firmer this morning my heart is gay beyond words my fellow-traveller is astonished at the beauty and riches of england from what he has seen of kent for my part i point out every fine prospect and am so proud of my country that my whole soul seems to be dilated for which perhaps there are other reasons the day is fine the numerous herds and flocks on the side of the hills the neatness of the houses of the people the appearance of plenty all exhibit a scene which must strike one who has been used only to the wild graces of nature canada has beauties but they are of another kind this unreasonable man he has no mistress to see in london he is not expected by the most amiable of mothers by a family he loves as i do mine i will order another chaise and leave my servant to attend him he comes adieu my dear little bell at this moment a gentleman has come into the inn who is going to embark at dover for new york i will send this by him once more adieu letter one hundred and sixty five to miss furmore at sillery clare street july twenty five 
i am the only person here my dear bell enough composed to tell you rivers is arrived in town he stopped in his post-chaise at the end of the street and sent for me that i might prepare my mother to see him and prevent a surprise which might have hurried her spirits too much i came back and told her i had seen a gentleman who had left him at dover and that he would soon be here he followed me in a few minutes i am not painter enough to describe their meeting though prepared it was with difficulty we kept my mother from fainting she pressed him in her arms she attempted to speak her voice faltered tears stole softly down her cheeks nor was rivers less affected though in a different manner i never saw him look so handsome the manly tenderness the filial respect the lively joy that were expressed in his countenance gave him a look to which it is impossible to do justice he hinted going down to berkshire to-night but my mother seemed so hurt at the proposal that he wrote to emily and told her his reason for deferring it till to-morrow when we are all to go in my coach and hope to bring her back with us to town you judge rightly my dear bell that they were formed for each other never were two minds so similar we must contrive some method of making them happy nothing but a too great delicacy in rivers prevents their being so to-morrow were our situations changed i should not hesitate a moment to let him make me so lucy has sent for me adieu believe me your faithful and devoted j temple letter one sixty six to miss firmer at Soleri, pall mall july twenty nine i am the happiest of human beings my rivers is arrived he is well he loves me i am dear to his family i see him without restraint i am every hour more convinced of the excess of his affection his attention to me is inconceivable his eyes every moment tell me i am dearer to him than life i am to be for some time on a visit to his sister he is at mrs rivers but we are always together we go down next week to Mr. Temple's in Rutland. They only stayed in town, expecting River's arrival. His seat is within six miles of River's little paternal estate, which he settled on his mother when he left England. She presses him to resume it, but he peremptorily refuses. He insists on her continuing her house in town, and being perfectly independent and mistress of herself i love him a thousand times more for this tenderness to her though it disappoints my dear hope of being his did i think it possible my dear bell he could have risen higher in my esteem if we are never united if we always live as at present his tenderness will still make the delight of my life to see him to hear that voice to be his friend the confidant of all his purposes of all his designs to hear the sentiments of that generous that exalted soul i would not give up this delight to be empress of the world my ideas of affection are perhaps uncommon but they are not the less just nor the less in nature a blind man may as well judge of colours as the mass of mankind of the sentiments of a truly enamoured heart the central and the cold will equally condemn my affection as romantic few minds my dear bell are capable of love they feel passion they feel esteem they even feel that mixture of both which is the best counterfeit of love but of that vivifying fire that lively tenderness which hurries us out of ourselves they know nothing that tenderness which makes us forget ourselves when the interest the happiness the honour of him we love is concerned that tenderness which renders the beloved object all that we see in the creation yes my rivers 
i live i breathe i exist for you alone be happy and your emily is so my dear friend you know love and will therefore bear with all the impertinence of a tender heart i hope you have by this time made fitzgerald happy he deserves you amiable as you are and you cannot too soon convince him of your affection you sometimes play cruelly with his tenderness i have been astonished to see you torment a heart which adores you i am interrupted adieu my dear belle your affectionate emily montague letter one hundred and sixty seven to captain firmer at Soleri, clarges street august one lord blank not being in town i went to his villa at richmond to deliver your letter i cannot enough my dear sir thank you for this introduction i passed part of the day at richmond and never was more pleasingly entertained his politeness his learning his knowledge of the world however amiable are in character at his season of life but his vivacity is astonishing what fire what spirit there is in his conversation i hardly thought myself a young man near him what must he have been at five-and-twenty he desired me to tell you all his interests should be employed for fitzgerald and that he wished you to come to england as soon as possible we are just setting off for temple's house in rutland adieu your affectionate ed rivers letter one sixty eight to captain firmer at Soleri, temple house august four i enjoy my dear friend in one of the pleasantest houses and most agreeable situations imaginable the society of the poor persons in the world most dear to me i am in all respects as much at home as if master of the family without the cares attending that station my wishes my desires are prevented by temple's attention and friendship and my mother and sister's amiable anxiety to oblige me i find an unspeakable softness in seeing my lovely emily every moment in seeing her adored by my family in seeing her without restraint in being in the same house and living in that easy converse which is born from friendship alone yet i am not happy it is that we lose the present happiness in the pursuit of greater i look forward with impatience to that moment which will make emily mine and the difficulties which i see on every side arising in bitter hours which would otherwise be exquisitely happy the narrowness of my fortune which i see in a much stronger light in this land of luxury and the apparent impossibility of placing the most charming of women in the station my heart wishes give me anxieties which my reason cannot conquer i cannot live without her i flatter myself our union is in some degree necessary to her happiness yet i dread bringing her into distresses which i am doubly obliged to protect her from because she would with transport meet them all from tenderness to me i have nothing which i can call my own but my half-pay and four thousand pounds i have lived amongst the first company in england all my connections have been rather suited to my birth than fortune my mother presses me to resume my estate and let her live with us alternately but against this i am firmly determined she shall have her own house and never change her manner of living temple would share his estate with me if i would allow him but i am too fond of independence to accept favours of this kind even from him i have formed a thousand schemes and as often found them abortive i go to-morrow to see our little estate with my mother it is a private party of our own and nobody is in the secret i will there talk over everything with her my mind is at present in a state of confusion not to be expressed i must determine on something it is improper emily should continue long with my sister in her present situation yet i cannot live without seeing her i have never asked about emily's fortune but i know it is a small one perhaps two thousand pounds i am pretty certain not more we can live on little but we must live in some degree on a genteel footing i cannot let emily who refused a coach and six for me pay visits on foot i will be content with a post-chaise but cannot with less i have a little a very little pride for my emily i wish it were possible to prevail on my mother to return with us to canada i could then reconcile my duty and happiness which at present seem almost incompatible emily appears perfectly happy and to look no further 
than to the situation in which we now are she seems content with being my friend only without thinking of a nearer connection i am rather piqued at a composure which has the air of indifference why should not her impatience equal mine the coach is at the door and my mother waits for me every happiness attend my friend and all connected with him in which number i hope i may by this time include fitzgerald adieu your affectionate ed rivers letter one sixty nine to campton firmer at salary august sixth i've been taking an exact survey of the house and estate with my mother in order to determine on some future plan of life tis inconceivable what i felt on returning to a place so dear to me and which i had not seen for many years i ran hastily from one room to another i traversed the garden with inexpressible eagerness my eye devoured every object there was not a tree not a bush which did not revive some pleasing some soft idea i felt to borrow a very pathetic expression of thompson's a thousand little tendernesses throb on revisiting those dear scenes of infant happiness which were increased by having with me that estimable that affectionate mother to whose indulgence all my happiness had been owing but to return to the purpose of our visit the house is what most people would think too large for the estate even had i a right to call it all my own this is however a fault if it is one which i can easily forgive there is furniture enough in it for my family including my mother it is unfashionable but some of it very good and i think emily has tenderness enough for me to live with me in a house the furniture of which is not perfectly in taste in short i know her much above having the slightest wish of vanity where it comes in competition with love we can as to the house live here commodiously enough and our only present consideration is on what we are to live a consideration however which as lovers i believe in strictness we ought to be much above my mother again solicits me to resume this estate and has proposed my making over to her my half-pay instead of it though of much less value which with her own two hundred pounds a year will she says enable her to continue her house in town a point i am determined never to suffer her to give up because she loves london and because i insist on her having her own house to go to if she should ever chance to be displeased with ours i am inclined to like this proposal temple and i will make a calculation and if we find it will answer every necessary purpose to my mother i owe it to emily to accept of it i endeavour to persuade myself that i am obliging my mother by giving her an opportunity of showing her generosity and of making me happy i have been in spirits ever since she mentioned it i have already projected a million of improvements i have taught new streams to flow planted ideal groves and walked fancy-led in shades of my own raising the situation of the house is enchanting and with all my passion for the savage luxuriance of america i begin to find my taste return for the more mild and regular charms of my native country we have no chaudiere no montmorency none of those magnificent scenes on which the canadians have a right to pride themselves but we excel them in the lovely the smiling in enamelled meadows in waving cornfields in gardens the boast of europe in every elegant art which adorns and softens human life in all the riches and beauty which cultivation can give i begin to think i may be blessed in the possession of my emily without betraying her into a state of want we may i begin to flatter myself live with decency in retirement and in my opinion there are a thousand charms in retirement with those we love upon the whole i believe we shall be able to live taking the word live in the sense of lovers not of the beau monde who will never allow a little country squire of four hundred pounds a year to live time may do more for us at least i am of an age and temper to encourage hope all here are perfectly yours adieu my dear friend your affectionate ed rivers End section five. Section six of the History of Emily Montague, Volume three by Francis Moore Brooke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Letters 170 through 180. Letter 170. To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall. Celeri, August the 6th. The leave of absence for my father and Fitzgerald being come some weeks sooner than we expected, we propose leaving Canada in five or six days. I am delighted with the idea of revisiting dear England and seeing friends whom I so tenderly love, yet I feel a regret, which I had no idea I should have felt, at leaving the scenes of a thousand past pleasures, the murmuring rivulets to which Emily and I have sat listening, the sweet woods where I have walked with my little circle of friends. I have even a strong attachment to the scenes themselves, which are infinitely lovely, and speak the inimitable hand of nature which formed them. I want to transport this fairy ground to England. I sigh when I pass any particularly charming spot. I feel a tenderness beyond what inanimate objects seem to merit. I must pay one more visit to the Naiads of Montmorency. Eleven at night. I am just come from the General's Assembly, where, I should have told you, I was this day fortnight announced Madame Fitzgerald, to the great mortification of two or three cats, who had very sagaciously determined that Fitzgerald had too much understanding ever to think of such a flirting, coquettish creature as a wife. I was grave at the assembly tonight, in spite of all the pains I took to be otherwise, I was hurt at the idea it would probably be the last at which I should be. I felt a kind of concern at parting, not only with the few I loved, but with those who had till tonight been indifferent to me. There is something affecting in the idea of the last time, of seeing even those persons of places for which we have no particular affection. I go to-morrow to take leave of the nuns at the Ursuline convent. I suppose I shall carry this melancholy idea with me there, and be hurt at seeing them too for the last time. I pay visits every day amongst the peasants, who are very fond of me. I talk to them of their farms, give money to their children, and teach their wives to be good housewives. I am the idol of the country people five miles round, who declare me the most amiable, most generous woman in the world, and think it a thousand pities I should be damned. Adieu, say everything to me, my sweet friends, if arrived. 7. 11 o'clock I have this moment a large packet of letters for Emily from Mrs. Melmoth, which I intend to take the care of myself, as I hope to be in England almost as soon as this. Good morrow, yours ever, etc., A. Fitzgerald. Three o'clock. I'm just come from visiting the nuns. They expressed great concern at my leaving Canada, and promised me their prayers on my voyage, for which proof of affection, though a good Protestant, I thanked them very sincerely. I wished exceedingly to have brought some of them away with me, my nun, as they call the amiable girl I saw take the veil, paid me the flattering tribute of a tear at parting. Her fine eyes had a concern in them, which affected me extremely. I was not less pleased with the affection the late superior, my good old countrywoman, expressed for me, and her regret at seeing me for the last time. Surely there is no pleasure on earth equal to that of being beloved. I did not think I had been such a favourite in Canada. It is almost a pity to leave it. Perhaps nobody may love me in England. Yes, I believe Fitzgerald will, and I have a pretty party enough of friends in your family. Adieu, I shall write a line the day we embark by another ship, which may possibly arrive before us. Letter 171 To Mrs. Temple Pall Mall, Celeri, August the 11th. We embark tomorrow, and hope to see you in less than a month, if this fine wind continues. I am just come from Montmorency, where I have been paying my devotions to the tutelary deities of the place for the last time. 
I had only Fitzgerald with me. We visited every grotto on the lovely banks, where we dined, kissed every flower, raised a votive altar on the little island, poured a libation of wine to the river goddess, and, in short, did everything which it became good heathens to do. We stayed till daylight began to decline, which, with the idea of the last time, threw round us a certain melancholy solemnity, a solemnity which deepened the murmur of the falling floods and breathed the browner horror on the woods. I have twenty things to do, and but a moment to do them in. Adieu. I am called down. It is to Madame de Roche. She is very obliging to come thus far to see me. Twelfth. We go on board at one. Madame de Roche goes down with us as far as her estate, where her boat is to fetch her on shore. She has made me a present of a pair of extreme pretty bracelets, has sent your brother an elegant sword knot, and Emily a very beautiful cross of diamonds. I don't believe she would be sorry if we were to run away with her to England. I protest I am half inclined. It is pity such a woman should be hid all her life in the woods of Canada. Besides, one might convert her, you know, and, on a religious principle, a little deviation from rules is allowable. Your brother is an admirable missionary amongst unbelieving ladies. I really think I shall carry her off, if it is only for the good of her soul. I have but one objection. If Fitzgerald should take a fancy to prefer the tender to the lively, I should be in some danger. There is something very seducing in her eyes, I assure you. Letter 172 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, Camarascus, August the 14th By Madame de Roche, who is going on shore, I write two or three lines to tell you we have got thus far and have a fair wind. She will send it immediately to Quebec to be put on board any ship going, that you may have the greater variety of chances to hear of me. Here is a French lady on board, whose superstition bids fair to amuse us. She has thrown half a little ornament overboard for a wind, and has promised I not know how many votive offerings of the same kind to St. Joseph, the patron of Canada, if we get safe to land, on which I shall only observe that there is nothing so like ancient absurdity as modern. She has classical authority for this manner of playing the fool. Horace, when afraid on a voyage, having, if my memory quotes fair, vowed his dank and dropping weeds to the stern god of sea. The boat is ready, and Madame de Roche going. I am very unwilling to part with her, and her present concern at leaving me would be very flattering, if I did not think the remembrance of your brother had the greatest share in it. She has wrote four or five letters to him since she came on board, very tender ones, I fancy, and destroyed them. She has at last wrote a mere complimentary kind of card, only thanking him for his offers of service. Yet I see it gives her pleasure to write even this, however cold and formal, because addressed to him. She asked me if I thought there was any impropriety in her writing to him, and whether it would not be better to address herself to Emily. I smiled at her simplicity, and she finished her letter. She blushed and looked down when she gave it to me. She is less like a sprightly French widow than a foolish English girl who loves for the first time. But I suppose when the heart is really touched, the feelings of all nations have a pretty near resemblance. It is only that the French ladies are generally more coquettes and less inclined to the romantic style of love than the English, and we are therefore surprised when we find in them this trembling sensibility. There are exceptions, however, to all rules, and your little belle seems, in point of love, to have changed countries with Madame de Roche. The gale increases, it flutters in the sails, my fair friend is summoned, 
the captain chides our delay. Adieu, ma chère Madame des Roches. I embrace her. I feel the force of its being for the last time. I am afraid she feels it yet more strongly than I do. In parting with the last of his friends, she seems to part with her rivers for ever. One look more at the wild graces of nature I leave behind. Adieu, Canada. Adieu, sweet abode of the wood nymphs. Never shall I cease to remember with delight the place where I have passed so many happy hours. Heaven preserve my dear Lucy, and give prosperous gales to her friends. Your faithful, A. Fitzgerald. Letter 173. To Miss Montague, Isle of Bick, August the 16th. You are a little obliged to me, my dear, for writing to you on shipboard. One of the greatest miseries here being the want of employment. I therefore write for my own amusement, not yours. We have some French ladies on board, but they do not resemble Madame de Roche. I am weary of them already, though we have been so few days together. The wind is contrary, and we are at anchor under this island. Fitzgerald has proposed going to dine on shore. It looks excessively pretty from the ship. Seven in the evening. We are returned from Bick, after passing a very agreeable day. We dine on the grass, at a little distance from the shore, under the shelter of a very fine wood, whose form, the trees rising above each other in the same regular confusion, brought the dear shades of Celery to our remembrance. We walked after dinner, and picked raspberries in the wood, and in our ramble came unexpectedly to the middle of a visto, which, while some ships of war lay here, the sailors had cut through the island. From this situation, being a rising ground, we could see directly through the avenue to both shores. The view of each was wildly majestic. The river comes finely in, whichever way you turn your sight. But to the south, which is more sheltered, the water just trembling to the breeze. Our ship, which had put all her streamers out, and to which the tide gave a gentle motion, with a few scattered houses, mainly seen amongst the trees at a distance, terminated the prospect in a manner which was enchanting. I die to build a house on this island. It is pity such a sweet spot should be uninhabited. I should like excessively to be Queen of Bick. Fitzgerald has carved my name on a maple near the shore, a pretty piece of gallantry in a husband, you will allow. Perhaps he means it as taking possession for me of the island. We are going to cards. Adieu for the present. August 18th. "'Tis one of the loveliest days I ever saw. "'We are fishing under the Magdalen Islands. "'The weather is perfectly calm, the sea just dimpled, "'the sunbeams dance on the waves, "'the fish are playing on the surface of the water. "'The island is at a proper distance to form an agreeable point of view, "'and upon the whole the scene is divine. "'There is one house on the island which, at a distance, seems so beautifully situated that I have lost all desire of fixing at Bick. I want to land and go to the house for milk, but there is no good landing place on this side. The island seems here to be fenced in by a regular wall of rock. A breeze springs up. Our fishing is at an end for the present. I am afraid we shall not pass many days so agreeably as we have done this. I feel horror at the idea of so soon losing sight of land and launching on the vast Atlantic. Adieu, yours, A. Fitzgerald. Letter 174 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, August the 26th, at sea. We have just fallen in with a ship from New York to London, and, as it is a calm, the master of it is come on board. Whilst he is drinking a bottle of very fine Madeira, which Fitzgerald has tempted him with on purpose to give me this opportunity, as it is possible he may arrive first, 
I will write a line to tell my dear Lucy we are all well, and hope soon to have the happiness of telling her so in person. I also send what I scribbled before we lost sight of land, for I have had no spirits to write or do anything since. There is inexpressible pleasure in meeting a ship at sea, and renewing our commerce with the human kind, after having been so absolutely separated from them. I feel strongly at this moment the inconsistency of the species. We naturally grow tired of the company on board our own ship, and fancy the people in every one we meet more agreeable. For my part, this spirit is so powerful in me that I would gladly, if I could have prevailed on my father and Fitzgerald, have gone on board with this man, and pursued our voyage in the New York ship. I have felt the same thing on land in a coach, on seeing another pass. We have had a very unpleasant passage hitherto, and whether to fight a better sailor than your friend. It is to me astonishing that there are men found, and those men of fortune too, who can fix on a sea life as a profession. How strong must be the love of gain, to tempt us to embrace a life of danger, pain and misery, to give up all the beauties of nature and of art, all the charms of society, and separate ourselves from mankind, to amass wealth which the very profession takes away all possibility of enjoying. Even glory is a poor reward for a life passed at sea. I had rather be a peasant on a sunny bank with peace safety, obscurity, bread, and a little garden of roses, than Lord High Admiral of the British fleet. Setting aside the variety of dangers at sea, the time passed here is a total suspension of one's existence. I speak of the best part of our time there, for at least a third of every voyage is positive misery. I abhor the sea, and am peevish with every creature about me. If there were no other evil attending this vile life, only think of being cooped up weeks together in such a space and with the same eternal set of people. If cards had not a little relieved me, I should have died of mere vexation before I had finished half the voyage. What would I not give to see the dear white cliffs of Albion? Adieu, I have not time to say more. Your affectionate A. Fitzgerald Letter 175 To Mrs. Temple, Pall Mall, Dover, September the 8th We are this instant landed, my dear, and shall be in town to-morrow. My father stops one day on the road to introduce Mr. Fitzgerald to a relation of ours who lives a few miles from Canterbury. I am wild with joy at setting foot once more on dry land. I am not less happy to have traced your brother and Emily by my inquiries here, for we left Quebec too soon to have advice there of their arrival. Adieu, if in town you shall see us the moment we get there, if in the country write immediately to the care of the agent. Let me know where to find Emily, whom I die to see. Is she still Emily Montague? Adieu, your affectionate A. Fitzgerald. Letter 176 To Mrs. Fitzgerald, Temple House, September 11 Your letter, my dear Belle, was sent by this post to the country. It is unnecessary to tell you the pleasure it gives us all to hear of your safe arrival. All our argosies have now landed their treasures, you will believe us to have been more anxious about friends so dear to us than the merchant for his gold and spices. We have suffered the greater anxiety by the circumstance of your having returned at different times. I flatter myself the future will pay us for the past. You may now, my dear Belle, revive your coterie with the addition of some friends who love you very sincerely. Emily, still Emily Montague, is with a relation in Berkshire, settling some affairs previous to her marriage with my brother, to which we flatter ourselves there will be no further objections. 
i assure you i begin to be a little jealous of this emily of yours she rivals me extremely with my mother and indeed with everybody else we all come to town next week when you will make us very unhappy if you do not become one of our family in pall mall and return with us for a few months to the country my brother is at his little estate six miles from hence where he is making some alterations for the reception of emily he is fitting up her apartment in a style equally simple and elegant which however you must not tell her because she is to be surprised her dressing-room and a little adjoining closet of books will be enchanting yet the expense of all he has done is a mere trifle i am the only person in on the secret and have been with him this morning to see it there is a gay smiling air in the whole apartment which pleases me infinitely you will suppose he does not forget jars of flowers because you know how much they are emily's taste he has forgot no ornament which he knew was agreeable to her happily for his fortune her pleasures are not of the expensive kind he would ruin himself if they were he has bespoke a very handsome post-chaise which is also a secret to emily who insists on not having one their income will be about five hundred pounds a year it is not much yet with their dispositions i think it will make them happy my brother will write to mr fitzgerald next post say everything affectionate for us all to him and captain fermor adieu yours lucy temple letter one hundred and seventy seven to captain fitzgerald belfield september thirteen i congratulate you my dear friend on your safe arrival and on your marriage you have got the start of me in happiness i love you however too sincerely to envy you emily has promised me her hand as soon as some little family affairs are settled which i flatter myself will not take above another week when she gave me this promise she begged me to allow her to return to berkshire till our marriage took place i felt the propriety of this step and therefore would not oppose it she pleaded having some business also to settle with her relation there my mother has given back the deed of settlement of my estate and accepted of an assignment on my half-pay she is greatly a loser but she insisted on making me happy with such an air of tenderness that i could not deny her that satisfaction i shall keep some land in my own hands and farm which will enable me to have a post-chaise for emily and my mother who will be a good deal with us and a constant decent table for a friend emily is to superintend the dairy and garden she has a passion for flowers with which i am extremely pleased as it will be to her a continual source of pleasure i feel such delight in the idea of making her happy that i think nothing a trifle which can be in the least degree pleasing to her i could even wish to invent new pleasures for her gratification i hope to be happy and to make the loveliest of womankind so because my notions of the state into which i am entering are i hope just and free from that romantic turn so destructive to happiness i have once in my life had an attachment nearly resembling marriage to a widow of rank with whom i was acquainted abroad and with whom i almost secluded myself from the world near a twelvemonth when she died of a fever a stroke i was long before i recovered i loved her with tenderness but that love compared to what i feel for emily was as a grain of sand to the globe of earth or the weight of a feather to the universe a marriage where not only esteem but passion is kept awake is i am convinced the most perfect state of sublunary happiness but it requires great care to keep this tender plant alive especially i blush to say it on our side women are naturally more constant education improves this happy disposition the husband who has the politeness the attention and delicacy of a lover will always be beloved 
the same is generally but not always true on the other side i have sometimes seen the most amiable the most delicate of the sex fail in keeping the affection of their husbands i am well aware my friend that we are not to expect here a life of continual rapture in the happiest marriage there is danger of some languid moments to avoid these shall be my study and i am certain they are to be avoided the inebriation the tumult of passion will undoubtedly grow less after marriage that is after peaceable possession hopes and fears alone keep it in its first violent state but though it subsides it gives place to a tenderness still more pleasing to a soft and if you will allow the expression a voluptuous tranquillity the pleasure does not cease does not even lessen it only changes its nature my sister tells me she flatters herself you will give a few months to hers and mr temple's friendship i will not give up the claim i have to the same favour my little farm will induce only friends to visit us and it is not less pleasing to me for that circumstance one of the misfortunes of a very exalted station is the slavery it subjects us to in regard to the ceremonial world upon the whole i believe the most agreeable as well as most free of all situations to be that of a little country gentleman who lives upon his income and knows enough of the world not to envy his richer neighbours let me hear from you my dear fitzgerald and tell me if little as i am i can be any way of the least use to you you will see emily before i do she is more lovely more enchanting than ever mrs fitzgerald will make me happy if she can invent any commands for me adieu believe me your faithful etc ed rivers letter one hundred seventy eight to colonel rivers at belfield rutland london september fifteenth every mark of your friendship my dear rivers must be particularly pleasing to one who knows your worth as i do i have therefore to thank you as well for your letter as for those obliging offers of service which i shall make no scruple of accepting if i have occasion for them i rejoice in the prospect of your being as happy as myself nothing can be more just than your ideas of marriage i mean a marriage founded on inclination all that you describe i am so happy as to experience i never loved my sweet girl so tenderly as since she has been mine my heart acknowledges the obligation of her having trusted the future happiness or misery of her life in my hands she is every hour more dear to me i value as i ought those thousand little attentions by which a new softness is every moment given to our affection i do not indeed feel the same tumultuous emotion at seeing her but i feel a sensation equally delightful a joy more tranquil but not less lively i will own to you that i had strong prejudices against marriage which nothing but love could have conquered the idea of an indissoluble union deterred me from thinking of a serious engagement i attached myself to the most seducing most attractive of women without thinking the pleasure i found in seeing her of any consequence i thought her lovely but never suspected i loved i thought the delight i tasted in hearing her merely the effects of those charms which all the world found in her conversation my vanity was gratified by the flattering preference she gave me to the rest of my sex i fancied this all and imagined i could cease seeing the little siren whenever i pleased i was however mistaken love stole upon me imperceptibly and en bodinant i was enslaved when i only thought myself amused we have not yet seen miss montague but we go down on friday to berkshire bell having some letters for her which she was desired to deliver herself i will write to you again the moment i have seen her the invitation mr and mrs temple have been so obliging as to give us is too pleasing to ourselves not to be accepted we also expect with impatience the time of visiting you at your farm adieu your affectionate j fitzgerald 
letter one hundred and seventy nine to captain fitzgerald stamford september sixteenth evening being here on some business my dear friend i receive your letter in time to answer it to-night we hope to be in town this day seven night and i flatter myself my dearest emily will not delay my happiness many days longer i grudge you the pleasure of seeing her on friday i triumph greatly in your having been seduced into matrimony because i never knew a man more of a turn to make an agreeable husband it was the idea that occurred to me the first moment i saw you do you know my dear fitzgerald that if your little siren had not anticipated my purpose i had designs upon you for my sister through that careless inattentive look of yours i saw so much right sense in so affectionate a heart that i wished nothing so much as that she might have attached you and had laid a scheme to bring you acquainted hoping the rest from the merit so conspicuous in you both both are however so happily disposed of elsewhere that i have no reason to regret my scheme did not succeed there is something in your person as well as manner which i am convinced must be particularly pleasing to women with an extremely agreeable form you have a certain manly spirited air which promises them a protector a look of understanding which is the indication of a pleasing companion a sensibility of countenance which speaks a friend and a lover to which i ought to add an affectionate constant attention to women and a polite indifference to men which above all things flatters the vanity of the sex of all men breathing i should have been most afraid of you as a rival mrs fitzgerald has told me you have said the same thing of me happily however our tastes were different the two amiable objects of our tenderness were perhaps equally lovely but it is not the mere form it is the character that strikes the fire the spirit the vivacity the awakened manner of miss firmer won you whilst my heart was captivated by that bewitching languor that seducing softness that melting sensibility in the air of my sweet emily which is at least to me more touching than all the sprightliness in the world there is in true sensibility of soul such a resistless charm that we are even affected by that of which we are not ourselves the object we feel a degree of emotion at being witness to the affection which another inspires tis late and my horses are at the door adieu your faithful ed rivers letter one hundred eighty to miss montague rose hill berkshire temple house september sixteen i have but a moment my dear emily to tell you heaven favours your tenderness it removes every anxiety from two of the worthiest and most gentle of human hearts you and my brother have both lamented to me the painful necessity you were under of reducing my mother to a less income than that to which she had been accustomed an unexpected event has restored to her more than what her tenderness for my brother had deprived her of a relation abroad who owed everything to her father's friendship has sent her as an acknowledgment of that friendship a deed of gift settling on her four hundred pounds a year for life my brother is at stamford and is yet unacquainted with this agreeable event you will hear from him next post adieu my dear emily your affectionate l temple end of section six end of the history of emily montague volume three by francis moore brook thanks for visiting timeless audiobooks please remember to like comment share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads